Hello, everyone. Audiobook Collection here. The upcoming audiobook is a special dedication to one of our incredible Patreon supporters. If you're interested in making your own personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. You can find the link to my Patreon account in the video description below. Your support means the world, and I'm thankful for you joining me on this thrilling audiobook journey. Also if you want audiobook of 300 plus novel you can visit my Kofi shop where you can buy a Google Drive link for just $35. Chapter 51, The Masochistic Nature of Elves. This was a great result to say the least and after a good 10 minutes, I felt incredibly hungry, like my cells were desperately crying out for energy. I could also hear Hermione's stomach growl as it was next to my head. I smiled gently before sitting up and getting off of the couch. Come on, I'm hungry, let's got eat something in the kitchen, I said extending out a hand. Hermione smiled helplessly as her stomach continued to growl and took hold of my outstretched hand and used it to pull herself up. We walked towards the kitchen through the empty corridors of the castle. It seemed to be just after dinner time, so we were still allowed to roam the castle. We soon made it to a corner of the school where students would usually ignore, this was where the kitchen was located. Behind a pair of rusty and worn outdoors, a cacophony of noise could be heard. Walking in we saw house elves running around doing their own thing, jumping around, cooking, and so on. They were small, frail, and looked malnourished. They had gray skin, big pitiful eyes, and large disproportionate heads compared to the rest of their bodies. As soon as we appeared all the busy elves stopped suddenly and looked towards us in sync. It was freaky, like we walked into a beehive. Hello, me and my friend were hungry, and we were wondering if you could cook something. I asked warmly and respectfully. The elves were quiet for a couple of seconds before they broke out into cheers and ushered us in to take a seat at the only table there. They prepared anything we wanted and as soon as it was served, we ate like we were starved for a week. What would have filled me up before wasn't even classified as an appetizer now, it was like my body was absorbing the energy from the food as fast as I swallowed it. Something similar was happening to Hermione as we continued to eat for an hour before finally being full. The elves were over the moon since they could cook for someone for so long and seeing us eat so happily made them even happier. Hermione however had a frown on her face as she observed the elves walking around doing their own thing. I knew what she was thinking, she was still good-natured and strived for equality and all that justice shit. You're probably thinking that it's unfair how the elves are treated right. I said with a smile. Hermione turned her head sharply and looked at me in total surprise. H how did you know, she asked in puzzlement. Because I know your personality, I said as I flicked her forehead. You're thinking that it is unfair, that the treatment is close if not the same as slavery, right? I asked while looking at her. She nodded seriously. Right, they don't get paid, no holidays, and they have to work constantly, what type of life is that? She asked indignantly. You might see it as unfair from your perspective because you were brought up in a human environment, where social norms frown upon such acts. Elves are different, they work off magic, that's their source of energy, they need it to survive, or they will go crazy and soon after die. They will work for someone who can provide magic to them since they can't gather it themselves, I explained. Hermione looked at me before turning to look at the elves who were scurrying around busily as always. She had a pensive look as she thought over my words. They work for wizards and witches because we can provide them with the sustenance to live. They seem to like working a lot which made it that much more appealing to the wizarding community to form a pact with the little fellows. You can't use muggle common sense in the magical world Hermione, I said with a shrug. But can't they be treated better? She asked, still refusing to accept the facts. I sighed, they are treated the way they want to be treated Hermione, elves punish themselves as a form of motivation. By treating them better you are depriving them of their motivation and will therefore hurt themselves. I don't know why they do this, but it works out for both parties and therefore should be left as is. But I do agree with you on one point, some house elves are mistreated to extreme measures, and they should have more rights and laws to stop them from being abused. Hermione looked up at me with a smile and nodded. I understand what you mean, we can't change their nature, maybe it was an evolutionary change, either way, they want to work, and magic is their reward which is totally fine if they are happy with that, and I do think that elves deserve better treatment to stop them from being abused, she said seriously. We continued to talk as we waved goodbye to the elves who seemed to be saddened at our departure. I can say one thing though, I'm happy that elves are the way they are and have such a limitation, I said. Hermione turned her head sharply and looked at me with an infuriated gaze. Relax let me explain before you go on a rampage. Imagine if elves didn't have this weakness and were able to apparate wherever they wanted, use magic wherever and whenever they wanted. Our magic can't stop them, no one is able to apparate into the castle no matter who they are, but elves can, they can't be stopped. Imagine what a war between us would look like, we would most likely lose a lot of people, I said seriously. Hermione shuddered at my explanation and the more she thought about it the paler she got. Relax, I'm happy with you wanting to expand their rights, I back you 100% but I'm just giving you the whole picture, so you aren't ignorant of the facts, I said as I patted her shoulder gently. She nodded at my words and became determined again. It's good to have a goal, after all, I need to have someone run the Ministry of Magic in my stead, I thought with a knowing smile. You're choosing her, Drac said with a surprised tone. I shrugged, why not Drac, she is smart, capable, and most importantly she is a good person who has me backing her. No one can push her around, plus, I can't be fucked being a minister of magic, 
that's not my cup of tea, I said in my mind. Well, the last part was a given, but it still comes as a surprise that you chose her so early on, I thought you would take longer to decide he said truthfully. Nah, Hermione has all the qualities of a minister of magic, it will be a great fit. Plus, with me going on a rampage against the pure families, it will just be a headache to deal with. But you do know she is a muggle-born, many will be against it Tom he said. What do you think my goal is Drac? It's obviously to stop all the muggle-born hate, and Hermione will have me to support her. With my show of strength against the radical purist families, no one will ever think about going against her. The era of pure blood superiority will end by my hand, Hermione will be the best choice to spearhead the new generation of thought. I said adamantly. Chapter 52, Time Flies. The next 30 days or so passed like breeze. We trained incredibly hard since the potion would be active for exactly one month. It was enjoyable to have the entire common room to ourselves except for Ron and Harry who played magical chess. I found it boring to play since it was essentially chess but with moving pieces. I even played against Ron who was incredibly proud of his skills. It didn't go so well for him though as I completely dominated the entire round. I wonder if Dumbledore would still say the same things about Ron at the end of the year if he witnessed this match. Just thinking about Ron's face at the statement almost makes it worth it. The new year was nothing incredible, a feast like always, I sent a letter by all to the knights to congratulate them and wish them well which Hermione did as well. Students flooded back into the school on the 5th of January and school once again resumed. The weeks went by, and it was already the 25th of January and the potion had worn off. During said time though we frequently visited the kitchen and acquainted ourselves with the house elves. There was one named Tolly which we enunciated while in our little classroom who brought us food when we trained too hard to move. He was incredibly excited to be of service which Hermione had complicated feelings about. She was changing her viewpoint about them slowly due to my influence, but it would take a while. She was, however, getting more adamant on increasing their rights and treatment in wizarding society. We had obtained a lot from the potion during the course of its duration. Our level of fitness rose sharply, it was more pronounced in Hermione since she had previously done much less physical exercise, I had gotten taller and stronger which was getting rather obvious due to my clothes. I was lucky however since the clothes were magically imbued and could stretch to fit the wearer. Naturally, it had limitations. It was good to know that it would last me for the rest of the year before I would need to buy myself new clothes. I didn't even want to mention the clothes I brought, most of them didn't even fit me. I only had one or two pairs of clothes that were bigger than the rest that didn't look like they cut my circulation. Hermione naturally laughed at my misfortune before coming out with a grim face as she suffered from the same problem, albeit a bit less noticeably. I laughed as a way of getting back at her which landed me a kick on the shin. I never win. February rolled around and the rain was coming strong since late December. There wasn't as much snow but it was quite chilly, or at least that was what Hermione said since I couldn't really feel the cold. Classes were still boring, but I did pay a bit more attention since the end of year exams were coming up. Even though it was miles away, Hermione was still studying like a wild person. I didn't really do too much, I simply memorized all that was needed. Hermione was much more about theory while I was much more practical. She would do much better when it came to everything books and exams and help me when needed while I was much more inclined to practical stuff like physical exercise and spells and the lot. So it was incredibly convenient to bounce off of each other to help one another. February 22nd was a good day. Me and Hermione went over to see the Quidditch match as a change of scenery from the constant books we looked at all day. She was much more inclined to go this time since she was having a hard time concentrating. It was hilarious, Snape was a referee this time which was a show to behold in and of itself. But there was a brawl, or at least there would be according to the books. I tried to pick a spot that was away from the action but there were no spots and instead, we were thrust right into the middle of the group of troublemakers. During the match one of the Weasley twins managed to hit Snape with a bludger which I think was intentional, either way, the result was the same, total laughter in the stands. Later the brats began to fight, it started with Neville, Ron the Hothead, Draco, Crab, and Goyle. The brawl caused chaos all around the place which sadly ended up engulfing us in it. As Crab threw a punch towards Neville he slipped and it headed towards Hermione instead. Reacting quickly, I got in the way and caught it in time. I grabbed Crab's arm and twisted it behind his back before pushing him down the stairs. His face hit every step on his way down, almost cartoon-like, it was hilarious. Goyle tried to attack me and ended up suffering the same fate, although he had a softer landing as he ended up landing on top of Crab. Draco got punched in the eye by Ron which resulted in it going black. Overall, it was an enjoyable fight. The teachers intervened quickly but no one suffered major punishments. The match was also short-lived like Neville's consciousness as it ended five minutes later due to Harry catching the snitch. It honestly sounded like a game you would play in prison, catch the snitch I thought with a chuckle. As for Neville, he got knocked out cold by Crab and Goyle earlier after he attempted to stand up to Draco. Chapter 53, Easter Egg Hunt and First Chat. After the match, I saw Harry head in the opposite direction he should be going. He was probably tailing Snape and Quirrell as they had their little moment in the woods after the match. I didn't interfere since I cared little for the squabbles between a stuttering fool and an edge lord. We headed back to the common room where all the students from Gryffindor cheered for Harry. I never understood it, was it a cheat he had? I mean he never flew a broom before in his life and suddenly he's a prodigy, 
It's just not logical, but I can understand it in some way, after all, he has to be good at something. He's never been great at magic, maybe slightly above average when he bothers to learn a spell, and he's not particularly smart. He's incredibly reckless which is further accentuated when Ron is around. It's like Quidditch is the only thing that he excels at. The second half of the year is when things start to heat up and I was kind of looking forward to it. I would take Hermione's place when Harry and Ron are caught out of bed which will allow me to have detention with Hagrid who will subsequently take us to the Forbidden Forest. The sole reason to do so is to meet Voldemort for the first time and set my plan in action. It would be hard to set up since I wasn't friends with the duo, but following them to Hagrid's hut when they say the dragon hatch should be around the time Draco follows after them, eventually catching is the trio, now duo, out of bed. This would all happen later in May so for now there wasn't much to do except go to class, train and read books. Soon February flew by and so did March. Ron's birthday was in March which was the only event out of the ordinary for the Gryffindor house. Not that it was celebrated by many, but it was still something. Mine was also on the same day and I only receive a letter from the knights wishing me a happy birthday. Hermione was mad that I didn't tell her about my birthday since she didn't get me anything due to it. When's your birthday Hermione, this way we can both get something for each other next time, I said in an attempt to remedy the situation. September 19th, she said. I nodded, naturally I already knew her birthday, but it would come off as weird if I gave her a present since I shouldn't supposedly know it. Hermione began to study harder recently for God knows what reason. I don't really get why she tries so hard constantly, even I'm not that extreme. She's pretty much a human calculator with infinite memory storage, so she doesn't need to study so hard, but seeing her do so gave me the motivation to study too. So, April soon rolled around. It was finally getting interesting. If my memory serves me correctly, Norbert would be born at the end of the Easter holidays. By now it was made apparent that Hagrid had a dragon egg since he was caught snooping around in the library by Harry, Ron, and coincidentally me and Hermione. Harry and Ron got the clue and rushed after him and meddled like they usually did. It was interesting to see how they reacted, behaved, and how they figured it all out without the help of Hermione. It almost felt like a social experiment, very entertaining to watch. Hermione caught on to the clues and the odd behavior which didn't come as a surprise to me. She did seem interested in dragons but didn't want to meddle in what didn't concern her. It was surprising to witness since she would have originally been very interested in sticking her nose into it. It seemed that my presence and interactions with her had some effect. Easter holidays come quickly and with it tons of chocolates. There was even an Easter egg hunt which was childish but surprisingly very fun to do. Hermione and I competed to see which would get more eggs. They were scattered all over the school grounds and inside the castle itself. I smiled in amusement before making my way to the astronomy tower after making sure that Hermione wasn't following. I sat down cross-legged in the middle of the floor and started to perform a spell. It was a large-scale spell that Drac was guiding me through currently. I was able to do it quickly because he was able to transmit all the info to me via memory link. It was also a simple spell that attributed to me being able to pull it off so quickly. The spell involved visualizing the specific item you wanted and then casting the spell. It acted like a wave that spread throughout the entirety of the school. Probably only the teachers and Dumbledore would feel the wave pass through. As I did so, I thought about the image of the eggs. Soon the eggs that were hidden all around the school came flying to me one by one. The only sad part was that it did take time to set up the spell which means that some people would have already found some eggs, but I still got a giant pile of them in the corner. I smiled happily and got up before turning around only to see an old man standing at the doorway with a calm smile. I sighed, must have attracted the attention of Dumbledore. Not that I care, Dumbledore is not an enemy and having his attention will facilitate transactions between the two of us later. Chapter 54, Interesting Talk Mr. Knight, it seems that you have found a wonderful way of acquiring the eggs, he said with a smile as he observed the pile of chocolate in the corner. Not worth mentioning, just a little spell I tinkered with, I said with a shrug. It seemed that this was a spell that Dumbledore was new to, or at least that was what I could gauge from his expression. There was no way of knowing what he did or didn't know. It seems that you are quite the talent, Mr. Knight, top of your classes and you're outstanding in your use of magic in many fields, including, traveling around the school undetected, he said arching a brow as he looked at me. I couldn't help but grin. Well, I can't let Mr. Potter have all the fun now, can I? I asked with a knowing smile. Dumbledore seemed to be surprised by my statement, but he was only a little surprised and quickly returned to being calm. Oh, by the way you're looking at me you seem to suggest I had something to do with that, he asked. Professor Dumbledore, who else would give him the cloak of invisibility? And Potter coincidentally finding the mirror of Arist just in time to use the cloak, you may be able to fool Potter, but it is an insult to my intelligence to be treated like him, I said while shaking my head. Interesting, you seem to know more than you let on, Mr. Knight, said Dumbledore with a gentle smile. Well, what can I say, schemers think alike, I said with a shrug while looking at him squarely in the eye. Dumbledore was genuinely surprised this time, I caught a glint in his eyes for a split second before it faded. Before I could do much more, memories were trying to surface in my head that were irrelevant to the current conversation. Damn, he's using legilimency on me right off the bat? He's too good Drac. Help, I can't stop him. 
Relax, I got him, he won't be accessing anything important, but you need to end the conversation quickly I can't hold him off for long, after all, this isn't my body he said calmly but quickly. I grinned at Dumbledore whose face visibly changed. Asterisk gasp that is a big no-no Dumbledore, using legilimency on a student. You should know better, I said faking a shocked expression for a second before going back to normal as if I failed to pull it off. I walked towards the eggs and put them all into my bag that had the expansion charm. You are an outstanding young man Mr. Knight, this is one of the rare few times I have ever been unsuccessful, he said seemingly not caring at all about the result. Well, there are always surprises in life, but I'll tell you something, I'm on your side, I have no qualms with your little game concerning the Potter boy, you have your reasons, I'm sure of it, I said as I once again smiled knowingly. Dumbledore seemed to be tongue-tied for a second as he looked at me. You are not a simple boy, are you, he said as he smiled once again. Of course not. Big waves will surge in the coming years, both of us will be swept in by them, whether we can float to safety or not, will all come down to how much we prepare in advance. It is, however, commendable what you are trying to do with Potter, as irresponsible as it may be to the rest of the school it is a sacrifice worth making for the greater good, right? I accentuated for the greater good in the sentence as a way of teasing the old man. It seemed to work. He looked at me weirdly for a moment before nodding. His smile seemed to have faded away at some point though. You are fascinating, maybe only a few are comparable in terms of talent in the past century, he said thoughtfully. Who do you mean, Riddle, Grindelwald, or perhaps you're blowing your own horn a tad bit, I said with a soft chuckle. Dumbledore couldn't remain calm, and he looked at me weirdly again. It seems that the future will be very murky in the coming years Mr. Knight. I can only pray that you do not end up like those who have come before you, he said meaningfully. Clearly, he meant Riddle and Gellert. Well, isn't there an easy way to show my sincerity? Come, give me your hand, I said while stretching out mine in an inviting gesture. Dumbledore didn't hesitate much and complied. Drac, transfer the emotions I displayed on the day I got sent to the Knight's estate and who they are directed to. Manipulate them a tad bit though. Make sure that it is focused on Voldemort and not the Ministry, I said in my head. No worries he said succinctly. Dumbledore's face visible changed a couple of moments later before his brows knitted together tightly. Then, they slowly loosened and before a small smile spread on his lips. As you can see, you and I share a common goal and adversary, I said with a shrug before passing by him and starting walking down the stairs. Mr. Knight, I look forward to our future encounters, said Dumbledore as he turned around. Oh yes, that won't be too far in the future, maybe we should share a cup of tea and some sherbet lemons, I said with a laugh before waving without turning around. Dumbledore was surprised once again, how did he know that he liked sherbet lemon candy? It puzzled him before a smile appeared on his face as he gazed at Tom's back. He was on guard against the possibility of Tom being another up-and-coming Dark Lord until he felt the deep emotions and who they were directed at. He was eager to see what Tom would show him. He turned and walked towards the guard rail and looked up at the moon with a pensive expression. This is getting interesting, he said before disappearing. Chapter 55, Karma. As I walked down the stairs, I couldn't help but laugh at the conversation just now, I revealed a lot of information that I theoretically shouldn't know. If you know that then why did you do it? Drac asked. Because it was necessary. Well, partly, the other part was me wanting to mess with him. Sure, it was reckless, but do I care? Not really. Dumbledore is too busy trying to mold Harry into the Voldy Destroyer. I don't have a problem with that, I don't believe in the prophecy that only either one of the two can kill each other. That is pure nonsense in my opinion. Power dictates the winner, not fate, and strings and all that shit, I said as I walked down the nearest corridor while my footsteps echoed. As for why it's necessary, well that is because I need to him to teach me and provide me with the materials needed to improve within the school grounds. I need access to the forbidden section in the library and helping Harry will facilitate the process. And if Dumbledore knows that I am even remotely promising with the knowledge I have just shown he will not hesitate to provide me with what I need. He is a teacher after all, so I will be able to learn the expecto patronum from him which I wouldn't be able to learn from Lupin. I could use legilimency on Harry after Lupin teaches him but why go through so much effort? It is all a part of the plan, naturally, in order to make him teach me properly, I will need to allow the basilisk to do its job until the school is borderline shutting down next year. Like a marvelous clown once said, if you're good at something never do it for free, simple as that, you're evil. Huh? You're one to speak, dragon of fire and destruction what part of that name doesn't scream out evil? Drac didn't speak, after all, it was sound logic. Sure, it could be wrong but from what he told me about his past I was sure I wasn't. Anyway, I'm starting to wonder which one is the schemer here, you, or the old man Drac said with a chuckle. That's beside the point, what I'm doing must be done if I'm going to get stronger. I walked back down towards the great hall where the students were eating and talking. The competition between Hermione and me was that the loser would do the homework of the other for the rest of the school year. So, about a month, I somehow struggled to see how this was a punishment for her, and maybe, she said it that way on purpose, so win or lose, she benefits. I saw Hermione sitting down on a table and when she noticed me, she beamed a triumphant smile. I couldn't help but smile and shake my head, I thought about what her face would look like when she saw all the eggs I got. She got up and put her hands on her hips with a smile still on her face. What are you smiling at? Gasp you don't think you've won, do you? I said teasingly while grinning. 
Hermione saw my face and her smile dimmed a little. I didn't really care and simply tipped all the eggs I got over the table. I then realized it was a bad choice as all the eggs came bursting out and spread all over the table. Some rolled off and onto the ground. This naturally caught the attention of the people at our table and even the surrounding tables. The teachers also looked over, and I even saw Dumbledore sitting down in his usual spot with a knowing smile. I could only shake my head at my miscalculation. Hermione by now was no longer smiling but could instead be seen pouting as she looked at the massive number of eggs all over the place. She then looked at her medium-sized bucket that reached her knees and sighed in disappointment. Just as I was about to claim the prize Dumbledore got up and made his way over before patting the discouraged Hermione on the shoulder. Mr. Knight, you wouldn't want to claim being the winner with the method you used, would you, he said with an arched brow. Everyone looked at Dumbledore before looking at me. I frowned heavily at his words. There were no rules to begin with, I argued, it was a fact. Oh, but there is, here take a look, only you didn't follow them, I took the piece of parchment that Dumbledore summoned out of thin air. It only had one fucking rule on it. No use of large-scale spells. I finally understood, Dumbledore was a petty old man. Hermione who looked at the parchment looked up at me and seemed to realize something and then she beamed a bright smile. I won, ha ha ha, I won, Tom, you're doing my homework for the rest of the year, she said laughing happily. My frown deepened as soon as she finished her words, not only that but as soon as others heard what she said, they began to laugh as well. I really had the urge to use fiend fire on all of these fuckers. Ha 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 ha, who told you to fuck with the old man kid Drac burst into laughter. Dumbledore showed a triumphant smile as he gazed down at me. I couldn't help but praise the old man, he really knows how to make the best use of the situation. There is no way to refute this since all the teachers would back Dumbledore and I would come off as bad-tempered for refuting the clearly stated rules the old goat came up with on the spot. Hermione was too caught up on finally beating me at something that she didn't realize the oddities in the situation. I could only sigh and give in. Karma really is a bitch. I'll make sure to get you back for this I thought as I glared at Dumbledore. He smiled warmly not caring much for my glare and walked away. The night passed like this with everyone happy except me who was stuck doing the girl's homework. Even Ron decided to grow a pair of balls and started teasing me to no end. That was the straw that broke the camel's back, I snapped and punted the red-headed idiot across the common room. The kid had the audacity to come here and wantonly spout shit. Who gave him such courage? Chapter 56, What a Joker. May 6th soon arrived. During the past week week and a half, Hermione and I studied steadily and with determination, much to Ron's ire. I never understood what the kid's problem was with studying, he seemed disgusted whenever he saw us studying but he would fail if he didn't, nothing good came out of being lazy, it really intrigued me to see just what made Ron Weasley tick. I needed to make sure to dissect him when he eventually got himself killed after one of his many stupid ideas. The day passed like any other except for Ron and Harry's odd behavior, as if they were planning something. It wasn't noticeable until later today, it didn't really bother me or provoke my curiosity as I knew exactly what they were planning. I kept quiet and observed their behavior for a little while before heading towards our classroom to do some spell practice. I made sure to practice the incarcerous spell since I would have to use it when facing Voldemort. It wasn't a hard spell to master but I wanted to make sure that I had it down pat since mistakes under such situations could prove to be deadly. I was not that worried though since I knew that the centaurs were close by in case a problem occurred. Naturally, I don't want to rely on others when I have a way to deal with it on my own. The reason I wanted to talk to Voldemort was that I needed to set up the most optimal situation during the later fight over the Philosopher's Stone. If I could come off as one of Voldemort's followers during our up-and-coming encounter, then it would make it easier to catch him off guard later if I needed to appear in the mirror room with Harry. Naturally, I could just attack him straight off the bat but having a backup plan in case I am put into a passive situation at first would come in handy. The battle could go many ways. I can't take the risk that anything could go wrong. If Coral used Avida Kedavra there could be many things potentially going to shit. The possibilities are endless. Petunia Evans Disley served as Harry's anchor to life due to her being Lily's sister, but there might be some difference in this world and the one in the book, what would happen if he can't block it? If Quirrell instead used a physical spell or the blast from the likes of C.O.N.F. Ringo, Harry can't be immune to all damage, he is still very much killable, even if Quirrell is an idiot, the chances are still there. I have no idea what would happen if Quirrell uses Avida on Harry, after all, Quirrell is a temporary horcrux for Voldemort, I am clueless as to what the result would be. Would the scene in the forest repeat itself? Who would he meet? His parents maybe. And if he does have a choice, would he decide to come back to the living world? There are too many possibilities, but one thing is for certain. Harry is still valuable in order to distract Voldemort, his fixation over killing Harry due to the prophecy will allow me to grow in peace. It's the perfect cover for my goals as well. For example, I need to devour the book that Ginny uses next year, that is, assuming that Harry's death doesn't affect that interaction. If it did then I would have to raid the Malfoy Manor at some point. If Harry is dead then I have no way of explaining how I was able to open the Chamber of Secrets, sure I could bullshit my way out of it, and sure, it might work, but why go through all that trouble when Harry can take all of it for me? If Harry is dead, then I need to fight young Voldemort by myself without the element of surprise, and I would rather not put myself at such a disadvantage when Harry is there to suffer in my place. I need him to take the spotlight in order for me to grow in the dark. 
Overall, Harry has his uses and until I am able to kill Voldemort on my own, I needed to keep him alive. For now. Having thought about this, I wrapped up my training and walked back to the common room for some late night reading with Hermione before heading off to bed. I was especially vigilant of Harry and Ron who would be making their way over to Hagrid anytime soon. An hour passed before Harry and Ron showed movement, and they sneakily creeped out of the men's wing, down the stairs and into the common room. I had already gotten up by now and walked quietly behind them. They soon exited the common room and quickly made their way over towards Hagrid's hut that was a distance away from the castle. I had already used concealing spells on myself so that the duo wouldn't see me while following them. We soon reached the bridge that led to the other side where Hagrid's hut was located. Halfway across the bridge, I figured it was enough and undid the concealment before grabbing Ron by the collar and pulling him backwards. Ron didn't expect it at all and put up no resistance and soon found himself half hanging from the side of the bridge only being held by my hand. My strength was much higher than others, so manhandling Ron was a piece of cake. Harry who had heard the noise turned around to see me dangling Ron from the side of the bridge. He didn't have enough time to pull out his wand before I had used Expelliarmus to disarm him. TCH TCH TCH, so hasty Potter, what would have happened if I had dropped Mr. Weasley here, due to being frightened by your attack? I asked feigning a concerned look. Tom, release Ron right now, he said half yelling. He was at least mindful that it was the middle of the night. Poor choice of words Potter, I said before letting go of Ron. He began to fall and so disappeared over the guard railing. Harry's face turned visibly pale and rushed to the guard rail only to see Ron floating there upside down. I had used the Levi corpus to keep him there. I grinned while observing Harry's reactions. It made me feel like a certain villain. I pulled Ron by the legs and threw him back on the bridge, he landed on his ass with a resounding thud. Even I felt the pain on my tailbone from that one. Harry rushed to Ron to make sure that he was okay and only sigh in relief after making sure that he was dot chapter 57, Hagrid's hut. Why did you do that? Questioned Harry with tightly knit eyebrows as he looked at me. Do what? I asked in response acting innocently. Don't give me that Tom? Why did you drop him? He asked demandingly as his voice rose. Oh? You mean doing exactly what you asked me to do, I simple released him, just like you asked. Who are you blaming here Harry? Me who simply did as told, or you, the inconsiderate friend who asked the perpetrator to drop his one and only friend off a fucking bridge like a moron. I asked mockingly. Harry seemed to lose his cool and rushed towards me as he swung his fist forward. I couldn't help but sigh, I was seriously asking him this question, granted, the execution was somewhat lacking but still no need to attack me for it. I chuckled in my head. I saw him coming and simply kicked forward landing my foot on his stomach which not only knocked the wind out of him, but also planted his ass on the ground, effectively placing him next to the sorry excuse of a wizard that was Ron. Now that you're both seated, let's have a chat, shall we? I said while transfiguring a handkerchief into a chair while using incarcerus on both of them so that they couldn't move. So, tell me, what were you two were doing sneaking out so late at night? I asked calmly. Harry, and Ron who had just come back to himself after the ordeal looked towards me and grimaced. Why should we tell you anything? Ron said defiantly, because I will throw your worthless ass of this fucking bridge without a second thought, that's why, I said calmly. I chuckled inside my head as I saw Ron's face pale considerably. It seemed that it worked since Ron and Harry began to whisper something to each other before looking back at me with a begrudging expression. We were on our way to look at the hatching of a dragon egg, said Ron angrily. I pretended to be shocked. Hatching dragon? Where? I asked quickly. Ron got even angrier as seemed reluctant to tell me, but Harry nudged him slightly with his tied up body. I really needed to give Harry a treat after this, he was such a good boy. Hagrid, he got a dragon recently, he invited us to watch it hatch and here we are, but now that you've caught us, I assume you'll be ratting us out like the teacher's pet that you are, said Ron confidently with a disgusted look. Gasp I'm offended Mr. Weasley, but since I'm such a teacher's pet, I ought to clean up the trash lying around the school in order to please the teachers. I don't think anyone will miss you, and I'll probably even get points for getting rid of incompetent trash like you, I said mockingly as I got up and walked towards Ron. Ron started begging, as his face got paler, I stopped midway and sat back down on my chair again with a grin on my face. Anyway, you're wrong, opposite to what you stated oh so confidently, I will not be snitching, well, as long as you take me with you that is, I said with an evil smile. Harry and Ron looked at each other and their eyes brightened before looking back at me. Deal, they said in sync, it was hard trying to contain my laugher as I undid the spell binding them. They soon got up and watched as I turned the chair back into a handkerchief before putting it in my expansion bag. I had already been alerted of Malfoy being close by Drac but acted like I didn't know and continued forward with the duo. We made it down the snake-like stone steps that descended towards Hagrid's hut. Ron and Harry knocked on the big run-down wooden door which swung open after a little while. Hagrid appeared and gazed down at us before staring at me in puzzlement. He looked at Harry questioningly. This is Tom Knight, for certain reasons, he said with a frown, has decided to join us in observing the egg. Hagrid wasn't exactly the smartest person ever, but by no means was he stupid, but he wasn't exactly very good at picking up facial cues or their meaning. He took the statement at face value and ushered us in before closing the door after I stepped in. The events inside the hut played out exactly the same way that they did in the movie, Ron mentioned his brother Charlie who was involved with dragons and who would eventually be taking the egg away, 
He also talked about Fluffy and spilled some secrets which only made me chuckled. We spent around one hour tops before Hagrid spotted Malfoy peeping in through the window. As soon as we turned around, we only caught a glimpse before he ducked and ran off. I couldn't help but grin victoriously before quickly hiding it and turning back to face Ron and Harry who looked at me with blaming expressions. What are you two staring at? I asked. It's your fault that Draco followed us, he must have seen you, said Ron shamelessly. Well, maybe he didn't know the extent of his shameless words but still, to hell with him. I simply rolled my eyes and got up. My task here was complete, I had no intention of staying here even a moment longer. Good night Hagrid, I wish you the best of luck with your dragon, I said with a knowing smile before walking out the door, Ron and Harry caught up to me soon enough. I had no clue if Draco would snitch immediately or wait a week like in the book. I would preferably want him to do so immediately since that would speed things up. Either way was fine since I would be meeting Voldemort anyway. Do you think that Draco will tell the teachers? Asked Harry with worry. Probably, the kid is a nuisance and loves to annoy the shit out of the both of you so I won't not be surprised if he tells a teacher tonight, I said calmly. How can you be so calm? You got us in this mess, said Ron indignantly. His shamelessness blew me away. One, you have no proof he was following me. Two, he can't have seen me because I was invisible due to a spell you idiot. And three, he hates you more than he hates me, so he probably saw you and decided to ruin your night, I said with a shrug. As we walked by the corridors Professor McGonagall walked out of a classroom with Malfoy in tow. Good evening gentlemen, said McGonagall as she held a candle. Draco could be seen with a grin on his face which pissed Ron off even further. For once I was more than glad to see Draco's stupid face since this meant the plot could speed up. Chapter 58, Stage 1 of the plan, Success. Follow me, McGonagall said and walked back into the classroom she had just come out of. We soon stood in front of her desk as she held the candle in one hand illuminating the otherwise dark room. She looked at us for a second before starting her lecture. Nothing, I repeat, nothing, gives a student the right to walk about at night, she paused and looked at all four of us before speaking. Therefore, as punishment for your actions, 50 points will be taken. 50. Harry yelled as his eyebrows furrowed tightly. Each, said McGonagall as if adding to the punishment for the outburst. And to ensure that it doesn't happen again, all four of you will receive detention. She said adamantly. I could see Malfoy perk up when he heard that. Excuse me professor, perhaps I heard you wrong. I thought you said the four of us, he said accentuating the four as he stepped forward. His smug look was nowhere to be seen. No, you heard me correctly Mr. Malfoy. You see, as honorable as your actions might have been, you yourself were still out of bed after hours, therefore the punishment is equally as applicable to you as it is to them, she said emotionlessly. I could see Ron and Harry smirking from the corner of my eye as Draco grimaced at her words. I simply watched this like a spectator, I could care less about points, nor did I care whether they lost or gained them. That will be all, you will go to your rooms and stay there from now on. If I hear any of you being caught out of bed again, you will be dealing with a much more severe consequence, she said sternly before waving us out. We walked out of the classroom and closed the door and immediately after, Ron began to tease Malfoy. Didn't think your plan would backfire this hard did you Malfoy, said Ron with a smirk. You dirty little blood tray dash he paused and looked at me which made me smile. His face paled slightly. Hmph, whatever, I don't feel like getting any more detention tonight, he said attempting to act arrogant and unfazed as he walked away towards the Slytherin common room. Ron smiled and looked at Harry before directing his gaze at me. Do you have anything to say Weasley? I asked while looking at him in the eye. Nothing, but now that Draco has seen the dragon, we need to inform my brother Charlie so he can take it before he can say anything, he said while looking at both of us. Correct, your bother would be the best solution, talk to Hagrid about it during daylight hours tomorrow and get it all fixed. As much as I hate seeing your faces, Hagrid shouldn't suffer because of your oversight, I said before walking towards the Gryffindor common room. I paused when I saw that they weren't following, come on, what? Are you two looking to lose more points tonight? I asked with annoyance. Harry and Ron snapped out of it and followed closely behind me as we made our way back. I immediately went off to bed and slept through the night soundly upon return. Hermione was angered when she heard about it during transfiguration class since McGonagall was telling us when the detention would be. It was going to be held tomorrow night, which was fine by me, but until then I had to suffer Hermione's incessant complaints. She finally calmed down after getting tired and went back to normal. I saw Harry and Ron go to Hagrid's hut after class and assumed that they followed my advice. They should be picking up the baby dragon sometime in the next day. And that's what happened, tonight I saw Harry and Ron put on the cloak of invisibility and head out of the common room. I didn't bother to stop them since it was none of my business. It seemed to be successful as I was woken up two hours later by Ron and Harry who were getting back to bed. I was surprised that they managed to do so undetected but good for them. Hagrid wasn't thrown into the middle and everything was going according to plan. The night soon passed, and I was awoken by the rays of sunlight passing through the slightly parted curtains. I went down to the common room and walked to the great hall with Hermione where we sat down for breakfast. Why did you do it? She asked spontaneously as she turned her head towards me. Do what? I asked as I buttered my bread. Go with them, why? She asked curiously. I looked at her before casting the Muffliato spell silently. Because it's all part of a little plan I'm concocting, I said with a shrug. Can you tell me about it? She asked. 
Hmm, sure I can tell you some things. It's about the stone, my plan is to stop the person who's attempting to steal it from succeeding. I strongly believe it's Quirrell and therefore I'm taking measures against it. As for what this has to do with why I went with them, it's because it's connected. I can't tell you more because I simply don't have conclusive evidence, you will hear about it at the end of the year anyway, I said with a smile. Most of what I said was true, but I can't tell her it's to make sure that idiot Harry doesn't go killing himself. This is the real world, not some book. Sure, the plot was seemingly the same, but I can't take chances when I don't know to what extent my presence has altered future events. Apart from that, Dumbledore was going to spread the secret to the rest of the school anyway. I will need to make sure to be excluded from the rumors so that I'm not chucked into the spotlight. Hermione nodded slightly at my response. Don't worry, there will be a part later on where I'll need you to accompany me, I said truthfully. After all, having Hermione help Harry will allow us to guarantee entry to the forbidden section for both of us in the event that Dumbledore becomes stingy and only lets me in because only I contributed to Harry's and Voldemort's fight. Hermione nodded happily and continued to eat. It seemed that she was happy to be able to help. Well, if it meant she wouldn't kill me next year for not being able to access the forbidden section then I'm all for her inclusion. Chapter 59, Filch and his hate for children. The day quickly passed by and soon it was the afternoon. We were told to meet Hagrid at 8pm tonight for our detention. I was reading a book on petrification spells, such as Petrificus Totalus which was a very helpful and rather effective spell. Hermione demonstrated it in the movie and Neville fell flat on his back because of it. Talking about Neville, it seems that unlike the books he was not caught trying to warn Harry or Ron about Draco since he didn't hold on to the information. Not that it mattered. Another interesting detail was that Ron didn't get bitten by the dragon either. So, he was present when Neville should have taken his place. It seems that it played out more like the movie did rather than how the books depicted it. The allotted time was fast approaching, and I said my farewells to Hermione and left with Harry and Ron towards Hagrid's hut. On the way there we ran into Draco who had a sullen look on his face. He clearly didn't want to participate. As we made our way over to the hut, we came across Filch who was sent to oversee that we came at the time given. He seemed upset that we were only given such a light punishment. Because being sent into a monster infested forest is a light punishment. The old man had some screws loose. He reminisced about the good old days where punishment consisted of hanging kids by their thumbs, which was not the worst punishment if you think about it. If it was the muggle world then sure it would probably cause permanent damage to the joint from all the body weight but in the magical world, one day, and you're good as new. And if you lost your thumb, use magic to bring it back into existence. I can think of at least 15 different punishments that are worse than that. Public embarrassment for example, what teens hate the most is being laughed at by their peers and especially their crushes if they have one. It's simple and effective. The moon was bright, but the clouds scudding across it kept it from casting its silvery glow on us. From the path we walked on we soon saw Hagrid's hut, his windows were lit and before long a distant shout could be heard. Is that you, Filch? Hurry up, I want to get started. As soon as the shout was heard, I saw Harry's and Ron's initially pale faces regain some color. They were probably relieved that Hagrid was the one conducting the detention. I was probably thinking it had more to do with Dumbledore than anything else. And McGonagall being Dumbledore's pet, probably agreed right away. Filch though, didn't seem too happy with Harry and Ron's easing expressions. I suppose you're thinking you'll be enjoying yourselves with that oaf? Well, think again, boy it's into the forest where you're going and I'm much mistaken if you'll come out in one piece, he said ominously. I saw Ron stop in his tracks. Forest, he said, his face paling. We can't go in there at night there are all sorts of creatures in there werewolves, I heard, he said. TT was surprising since Draco was the one meant to say that line. I too find it odd, quite contradictory if whoever sent us on this detention to pick the forbidden forest. After all, didn't Dumbledore specifically say, all pupils are forbidden? I added with a smile. Everyone had pensive expressions as they thought over my words. Not so cocky now, are we Weasley, said Draco with an arrogant expression. Says the kid who scared of his own shadow, I said with a chuckle but froze the next second. Be but, if you're so brave, t then you don't mind taking on the werewolf behind you, all right. I stuttered as I pretend to be shocked and sacred while backing up. Draco's face paled as he spun around only to see nothing there. He turned around and his face contorted in anger. He was probably mad at my mocking smile directed at him. Even Ron and Harry chimed in with their own laughter. Before we could talk much more, Hagrid came striding forward towards us out of the dark. Fang at his heel. I saw him carrying a massive crossbow that looked almost, small in his hands. It was as big as my torso and yet he made it look tiny. Really reminded me of Shaq and his plastic water bottles. Abu time, he said. I've been waiting for half an hour already. All right, you guys. He asked as he looked at the pale Draco. You shouldn't be too friendly with them Hagrid, they're here to be punished after all, he said coldly as he looked at us. That's why you're late, is it, said Hagrid, frowning at what Filch had just said. Been lect you're in dem, eh? It's not your place to do that. Yeah done your bit, I'll take it from here, he said waving Filch off in annoyance. TCH, whatever, I'll be back at dawn, for what's left of them, he said before beginning to walk away. Don't let the door hit you on your way back you sadistic prick, I said with a grin. Filch stopped mid-step and turned around and glared at me fiercely. He seemed to look up for a second and turned around and left. 
I smiled and also turned to look, only to find Hagrid staring at Filch menacingly. You shouldn't talk to the staff like that Tom, he said sternly, but a small smile crept on his face. Ron turned to Hagrid and then stared into the forest. Hagrid, are we really going in there? He asked, nodding towards the deep black forest that seemed like it would eat you alive. I had no doubt it probably would. Yeah, can't do nothing about it, said Hagrid. Is it really that dangerous, Hagrid? Harry chimed in as he stepped up. It can most definitely be, he said before looking towards the forest. Right then, he said jolting us out of our thoughts. Now, listen carefully, cause it's dangerous what we're gonna do tonight, and I don't want no one talking risks. Follow me over here a moment. Comment. 9 Comment. Chapter 60, We're Off to See the Wizard. He led us to the very edge of the forest and held up his lamp to light up a small part in the immediate vicinity. He looked for a second before walking into the forest through a narrow, winding dirt track that disappeared into the black trees. A light breeze blew on our cloaks and hair as we peered into the abyss that connected each tree to the other. Look here, Hagrid said, his voice seemed like a lighthouse in the dark, pulling us out of our trance-like state as we observed the silvery liquid coating the edge of his four digits. See the silvery stuff on the ground and on my fingers? This is unicorn's blood. A unicorn in their bin hurt badly by Summit. This is the second time in a week. I found one dead last Wednesday. We're gonna try and find the poor thing. We might have tur put it out of its misery. And what if whatever hurt the unicorn finds us first? Asked Draco. I couldn't help but scream in my mind, red flag, red flag. The guy jinxed it. There's nothing that lives in the forest that'll hurt ya if you're with me or Fang, he said proudly. I couldn't help but laugh out loud which made everyone but Hagrid jump. I'm sorry, that was just such a good joke Hagrid I had to laugh. There are things in this forest that will kill you as easily as strolling in a park. You should know that far better than me. What? Do you think that silly crossbow will save you from trolls, giants and acromantulas? Please, there are things out there that will kill all of us in seconds. Not to rain on your parade or anything, but werewolves do exist here. We are just lucky it isn't a full moon. And don't get me started on Fang, might as well have brought out your other dog, maybe then it might have been more useful, I said truthfully while giving him a knowing smile. Hagrid looked at me with surprise and reproach. I just shrugged, the guy shouldn't dial down the danger here just to calm the nerves of a bunch of kids. Ron, Harry, and even Draco looked at me with pale faces as their bodies shook slightly from my words. As we walk forward Hagrid tried to calm down the trio as best he could, which seemed to work to some extent. We soon arrived at a fork in the trail. We will need to split off and search, if you hear or see anything, yell and we'll come running. Now, Ron and Draco, come with me, Harry and Tom, you go that way, he said as he pointed towards the rightmost path. Harry and I looked at each other and walked down the indicated path, and before long, Hagrid, Ron and Draco could no longer be seen. Honestly though, how stupid of an idea is this? Yeah sure, let's split into groups comprised of first years in a fucking deadly ass forest. Now that is what I call a punishment. Harry seemed to be on edge as we walked forward, I asked Drac to alert me when we were close to Voldemort so that I was ready. We walked for another five minutes down the narrow track filled with potholes, when I suddenly heard Drac's voice. Voldemort is 150 meters ahead, be careful, if you need help, just say the word he said confidently. I nodded silently and quietly took out my wand and hid it under the sleeve of my cloak. He would definitely try to attack us, but he wouldn't be expecting a 11, 12 year old to strike back. What I was curious about was why he always went for physical contact. Even in this confrontation coming up, he rushed towards Harry rather than using his wand. Because of Voldemort's existence within Quirrell answered Drac. It was like a light bulb suddenly turned on in my head, it seems that due to Voldemort's presence within Quirrell, he is debilitated. Probably due to the magic being siphoned out of him. Voldemort needs to survive some way, like a parasite. That might explain why Quirrell needs to feed on the unicorn. But wouldn't that mean that I wasn't needed? After all, Harry was protected by Lily's sacrificial spell. He couldn't be touched. You're wrong, he can still kill Harry. He is weak and can't use magic on a regular basis, but that does not mean he can't use it at all. If pushed into a corner, he will use it. Probably explains why he spent so much time trying to find Fluffy's weakness instead of simply killing it. Then what are the chances of him using a curse or a spell on Harry? 25%. From what I can feel, he will be able to top up on unicorn blood and be able to use magic again, but only for a short amount of time, about a month. I assume he fed on the unicorn to give him enough life force to sustain magical use if need be. Harry couldn't disarm Quirrell, after all, he learns the spell next year after Snape's performance. Which means that Harry is theoretically, easy pickings. He's defenseless, and I can't take a chance on his supposed plot armor. It seems that I'll need to attend their fight over the stone after all. Comment. 2 Comment. Chapter 61. The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. T. Tom, W. What is that? He said as he backed up suddenly. I looked in his direction and saw a cloaked figure reaching towards the unicorn on the ground. It lowered its head over the wound on the animal's neck and began to drink its blood. I smiled slightly and cast the reducto spell towards the cloaked figure. It was caught by surprise but somehow managed to dodge in time. The tree that was behind where the cloaked figure originally stood wasn't so lucky and instantly swirled and shattered into many pieces creating a very loud trunk snapping sound that reverberated throughout the forest. 
Upon landing, the hooded figure raised its head and looked right at me and hairy unicorn blood was running down the side of his mouth. It got up from its kneeling position and sped towards us as its feet left the ground. I waited until he was close enough. In Carceris, I said lightly, the cloaked figure who was an arm's length away couldn't dodge in time and suddenly found itself tied up by massive thick ropes, restricting all movement. What is that? Harry asked in a panic as he winced in pain while grabbing his forehead. He couldn't take it and had to kneel on the ground. I didn't answer and swiftly sent another stupefy, but the target was not the cloaked figure, but Harry instead. Harry was too busy trying to tolerate the pain to notice the spell and was swiftly knocked unconscious. I turned my head towards the cloaked figure who was wriggling around like a worm on the ground. I really want to kill him Drac. I do too, trust me, but we don't gain anything from it, neither can you truly kill him. You will only be killing the body he is taking shelter in. There is nothing we can do to permanently kill him at this time. Therefore, we must reap the most benefits from this to make up for it he said logically. I sighed softly in annoyance before observing the cloaked figure that was Voldemort. Why? asked Voldemort in a raspy, aged voice as he looked at the unconscious Harry and then at me. Dark Lord, I am the adopted son of one of your loyal supporters, Lucius Malfoy I said as convincingly as possible while bowing my head to hide the mockery in my gaze. Adopted then why do you not share the same name? he asked with suspicion. Yes, adopted, my biological father, another one of your many loyal supports died his last name was Knight. He was good friends with Lucius and left me in his care, that is why I do not share the same name, I said acting as innocent as possible while faking a slight shiver. Interesting, I didn't know Lucius was into charity, he said with a slight trace of surprise mixed in with mockery. But you have not answered my question, he said sternly. I can only thank Lucius for taking me in when he didn't have to, I said still bowing. My adopted father has been searching for you ever since you disappeared. Ever since I found out about the Philosopher's Stone, I expected you to be here to find it. Lucius. Voldemort said with a disdainful snort, out of all my servants who would have expected that Lucius would be so loyal. Dark Lord, do you need my help with anything, maybe acquiring the Philosopher's Stone? I said, as the son of your most loyal servant, I am willing to serve. I straightened my back and looked at him. Why attack me, if you knew it was me under the hood, he asked. Would you want a useless person helping you? I asked back instead of answering. No, I would not. Exactly, therefore it was done to prove my worth to you, to show you that I am worthy enough to serve you. Voldemort nodded slightly with a pensive look for a moment. Fine, I'll give you a chance to prove yourself, he said after a few seconds of thought. Thank you, I said while bowing again. As much as I didn't want to, the show must go on. I suggest the Dark Lord, to get out of here since the groundskeeper and other students would have heard my use of the Reducto spell, they will probably be here any moment now, I said with a bit of anxiousness in my voice. Voldemort looked at me deeply for a second before nodding, wait for my future order. How will I contact you? I said quickly as Voldemort was about to turn and leave. I have, connections inside, he said mysteriously and quickly fled into the never-ending darkness that submerged the entire forest. When Drac told me that Voldemort had left the 100 meter radius I dropped the anxious shivering act and spat on the ground. Fucking clown, I hissed. Who, you, asked Drac with a laugh. I ignored him and cast a spell that launched a flare into the air. I turned and looked towards the unconscious Harry and left him there since there was no point in doing anything to him. He would wake up by himself shortly anyway. I therefore sat on the tree roots nearby and looked at the dead unicorn lying motionless on the ground. It had lost all of its brilliance and was only left with a dull white colored pelt. Such a majestic creature used as a health pack, life is cruel. As I was deep in thought a deep voice came from behind me. Are you okay? It asked. I turned around sharply acting on edge and only relaxed when I saw a centaur looking at me with a surprised expression. You're not afraid of me, he asked in a pleasantly surprised way. Well, after what we just encountered, I don't think you scare me much, I said with a shrug. The centaur looked at me with surprise and concern. But where are my manners, Thomas Knight, I said with a nod. My name is Forenza, curious little human, he responded. Chapter 62, cloaked figure unmasked. Anyway, are you okay, he repeated. I waved him off. I'm fine but my classmate here is knocked out for some unknown reason and there is a dead unicorn over there, I said pointing at Harry before moving my hand and pointing at the dead unicorn. Before Forenza was able to speak a sudden voice came from behind him, what happened? It was Hagrid, Ron and Draco. I sighed, we found the attacker, well he was wearing a cloak over his face so I couldn't identify him or her. I don't really know what happened but after seeing the cloaked figure, Harry started to hold his scar in pain and passed out, I explained convincingly. Ron ran towards the unconscious Harry while Hagrid followed closely. Ron got on his knees and shook Harry a bit in an attempt to wake him. It wasn't long before Harry started to open his eyes and looked around in confusion. Thank Merlin, Yeri fine, said Hagrid as he sighed in relief. What happened Harry? asked Ron with a concerned look. Harry looked at me expectantly. What? I asked. You would know more than me, I fell unconscious unexpectedly after seeing the cloaked figure, he said with a shrug. There's not much to tell, as soon as you fell unconscious, I threw some spells like Reducto which you guys probably heard and that scared it away. It seemed incredibly weak, I said holding my chin with my hand as I pretended to be in deep thought. Do you think it's a vampire? asked Draco unexpectedly. No, 
I said shaking my head, if it was a vampire, I don't think it would need to cut open a wound this large to drink its blood. It has fangs for a reason. Plus, vampires wouldn't be so desperate as to go for unicorns. Normal human blood would do a good enough job, I explained. What could it be then? Harry chimed in after hearing my explanation. Harry Potter, do you know what unicorn blood is used for? Asked Forenza. No, said Harry shaking his head. We've only used the horn and tail hair for potions so far. That is because it is a cursed thing, to slay a unicorn that is, I explained, it is said that only a person who has nothing to lose at all, at the end of the rope per essie, would stoop the level so low as to commit such a crime. The blood of a unicorn will keep someone alive, even if they are an inch from death, but it comes at a horrible price. Due to slaying such a pure and holy creature so defenseless only to save your life, the person will live a half-life, a cursed life, from the moment the blood touches your lips, I concluded. Exactly, said Forenzo while nodding at my explanation. Unless all you need is to stay alive long enough to drink something else something that can bring you back to your full strength and power something that will mean you can never face death. Harry Potter, do you know what exactly is hidden in the school at this very moment? Asked Forenza. Harry was confused for a couple of seconds before looking at Ron in astonishment and realization. The stone? Of course the elixir of life. But I don't understand who. Can you really think of nobody who has waited for decades to return to power, who has clung to life like a cockroach, waiting for their chance? Forenza pushed. I could see Harry pale at the thought. He was slightly shaking. D do you mean, Harry spoke dryly, that was Valdash. Enough, yelled Hagrid. No more of this nonsense, we need to head back to the school, it is clearly not safe out here. Forenza, please take the unicorn with you, said Hagrid to which Forenza nodded solemnly. May we meet again if fate allows it. Harry Potter, said Forenza as he waved goodbye and carried the dead horse with him. A couple of other centaurs arrived and helped him carry it as they too disappeared into the darkness of the forest. We soon got ready and headed back to the castle. It was an awkward walk back, Harry was probably thinking of Voldemort. But I couldn't help but be in a semi-good mood. After all, I had accomplished my goal. Voldemort would probably believe me until I confront him. He has no way of verifying if what I said was true or not. He can't ask Draco since he's being secretive and Draco is a child, telling him would be unwise. So, there was a cause for celebration. We soon arrived back at the hut where Hagrid said his goodbye and walked back into his house. Filch who had been informed by Hagrid walked over to us with a grim face. He couldn't believe that we came out alive and grumbled that we didn't even stay in there for an hour and had to come back already. He complained the whole way back before disappearing after reaching the castle courtyard. Draco made his way back on his own to the Slytherin common room and Harry, Ron, and I made our way back to the Gryffindor one. Harry are you okay? asked Ron who looked over to see Harry still in thought. Harry raised his head up and looked at Ron and then at me. Do you think that Voldemort is back? asked Harry seriously. Ron hesitated since he wasn't sure. It was evident on his face. I simply shrugged. Probably, after all, he vanished, a body was never found. There are many mysteries about you know who. It doesn't really matter whether he is alive or not though. This thing about the philosopher's stone you guys mentioned and being able to give Voldemort strength again. It seems that someone is trying to steal it, I pretended to analyze. Ron and Harry looked at me in shock, H how did you get all that from a simple conversation, asked Ron. Weasley, don't compare me to your mental capacity, you wouldn't understand. It's not hard to figure all of this out, but since you two seem to be on the case, I'll let both of you work on it. As I said before, it doesn't matter who is trying to steal the stone, you just need to stop them, right? I asked. Right, said Harry while Ron had indignant written all over his face after being called stupid. I simply ignored him as we all went to our assigned beds and went to sleep. Chapter 63, New Acquaintances and Exams Begin. The night went by with Harry tossing and turning, Ron wasn't much better since it was probably a tough night for both of them. Especially Harry, meeting your parents killer would be tough. I was in the same position yet so very different at the same time. I will use Potter until he is of no further use and emerge from his shadow. He will be the flame that attracts the moth while I reap all the benefits. I need to act like a loyal follower in the presence of Quirrell since I will be under his and Voldemort's intense scrutiny. This will only be for a couple of weeks before the fated battle arrives. I hated having to act like this for the murderer of my parents, even if it wasn't by his own hands. Shaking away the thoughts that surged like waves in my head I thought about what to do. There were exams starting soon and I already had everything memorized, there was no point in paying attention. What I needed to do now was lay low and act normal as to not arise suspicion. I needed to bide my time. And just like that, two weeks went by, and exams started. Hermione being the hyperactive girl that she was, rushed some last minute study even though she had gone through the same stuff more than a million times. She had just as good a memory as me, I simply couldn't understand what she wanted to accomplish. But, unlike us, everyone else was super busy scurrying around like a group of ants trying to cram in some last minute study before the exams started. I even began to hang out with Seamus Finnegan since I was so bored when Hermione wasn't around. He was a jolly fellow with a good personality. His blonde hair and thick Irish accent made it fun to be around him. He would blow shit up every so often, but I would be prepared in advance so that I wasn't affected. Naturally, if you're hanging out with Seamus, Dean Thomas was around as well. He was a proper lad, well-dressed and seemed to be the rational one of the duo. 
He was a half-blood wizard who had short curly hair and was a bit taller than me. It was a bit of a shock when I saw him simply because I had a growth spurt after taking the potion. He was very fun to talk to and we had a lot of similarities. He loved to play games when he was small after his father died. What I found fascinating was that according to what I remember, his father was Regulus Black. It was quite interesting, to say the least. I was also interested to see if he appeared in the Black Ancestry painting. It was said that Sirius was the last family member from the Blacks but if Dean was really the son of Regulus Black then he should have inherited the Black family instead of Harry. But Sirius did give it all to Harry so there was that. I did gloss over that detail in the books, so the information wasn't all there. It was an interesting dynamic, nonetheless. Seamus was into fighting and all that which further increased our bond. When he found out I did something called MMA, he was fascinated. He asked me to show him and after sparring for a bit and throwing him around like a ragdoll for an hour Seamus was fascinated and began to ask more questions about it. I didn't mind too much since it was rare to share a common interest with others. Dean was into academics and had good grades, unlike Seamus which allowed us to share something in common. I even gave him pointers for the upcoming exams, so that he would do better. All in all, it was good to socialize with others that weren't Hermione. But she was irreplaceable in a certain sense. She was just unique in her conduct and behavior that brought a colorful flavor to my initially black and white life. In this dreadful heat, we could be seen seated in a big hall where all the tables were aligned neatly in rows. 10 desks wide and 20 deep making it a good number of students per batch of examines. We were given a new quill for the exams which had been bewitched with an anti-cheating spell. I didn't really care whether it had an anti-cheat spell or not, I aced the test with 30 minutes to spare and walked out of the test hall under the glares of all the other students. I spotted Ron giving me a deathly glare as I walked by his table which only made me want to drag his ass out the hall and beat the living daylight out of him. Noticing my gaze I saw him recoil back before burying his head in his empty papers that didn't have much writing on them due to his stupid habit of not studying. Harry wasn't much better but at least he had something down. The practical exams were a thing here as well. Professor Flitwick called us one by one into his class to see if we could make a pair of dress shoes tap dance across the desk, which was a very easy feat for me. I noticed Flitwick's expectant gaze as he saw me walk in. He wasn't disappointed when I performed it perfectly. I could have done more than that, but it was unnecessary as I wouldn't have gotten extra points. Professor McGonagall's practical exam was much more interesting to watch. She asked us to turn a mouse into a snuffbox points were given for how elaborate the design was, but points were also taken away if any of the mouse's characteristics, predominantly whiskers and fur were seen on it. Chapter 64, Exams. I was able to do it perfectly. I even went a step further and made a Michelangelo-like design on the side of the box with a beautiful ocean blue gem embedded into the golden case. It looked like something a queen would have in her room filled with jewelry and other things. Professor McGonagall was very surprised and impressed to see such a delicate yet detailed design in a snuff box. It just went on to further prove that I was much more inclined towards imagination and visualization. This was further accentuated when Hermione performed it and came out with an elegant yet basic design with all the proportions correct to the goddamn decimal place. But her design lacked any oomph it was more of a meh design that wouldn't catch much attention if put out on display. She still got full points since it was done according to the guidelines, but I actually got an extremely rare extra couple of points awarded to the best transfigured snuff box in the grade. The next practical exam was the Edge Lord Snape's. He made 90% of the students nervous as he glared at each and every one of them as if intentionally doing so to add pressure to the already nervous group. Neville could be seen shivering like a leaf in a hurricane as he stared at Snape with intense fear. It reminded me of the third year where it explored everyone's fears. I honestly think this is a very bad thing to do to others as it allows enemies to observe and note down the deepest fears of opponents. Sure, they were simply third years, but if I knew Ron had an irrational fear of spiders, I would sneak one in his bed every night. Ha 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 good idea Tom. I praised myself as a smile spread across my lips. I almost pity the redhead, almost he he said Drac with a burst of evil laughter. Getting my thoughts back on track, Snape would breathe down our necks at every turn as we attempted to make a forgetfulness potion. Hermione having some kind of natural talent with potions easily completed it in record time. Snape seemed to be more pleased with her now that she didn't show her know-it-all attitude during class. I didn't lag behind by much even with some hiccups and completed it as well. Sadly, Harry and Ron were in a league of their own, Harry did the best he could, but he seemed to be tired and in pain for some reason. Seeing him grab his scar I assumed it had something to do with Voldemort. And it seemed to be a recurring theme as it happened often after his encounter in the forest. I overheard Neville trying to comfort him, it seemed he believed that Harry had a terrible case of exam nerves. I knew that Harry was actually suffering from a lack of sleep due to waking up very often sweating profusely. Nightmares I assumed. I even used legilimency to see what he was seeing, and my guess was confirmed. He was seeming the hooded figure of Voldemort over and over again. Moving on, we had our last exam, History of Magic. A course I slept through without fail. I didn't even know what was going on most of the time and would only be awoken when class was done by Hermione who was equally not paying attention. The benefits of having a super memory were off the scales when it came to courses like History. It was a one-hour exam answering questions about batty old wizards who'd invented self-stirring cauldrons. 
After the soul draining exam finished and Professor Binns told us it was the end of the stipulated time and that we had to roll up our parchments, I couldn't help but cheer a bit. I don't think I have ever experienced time passing so slowly as it had for the past hour. I think I even saw flies flying in slow motion. That was a lot easier than I thought it would be, it seems I did all that studying for nothing, especially the 1673 werewolf code of conduct or the rebellions of the goblins, such a waste of time, said Hermione with a regretful tone. I flicked her forehead. What did I tell you, you shouldn't have studied so hard, there was no need for it, but your effort is most commendable, maybe you'll get a medal, I teased. Hermione who had just finished didn't get angry and only laughed with me before walking out of the class alongside all the other relived and stress-free students. That afternoon, having just finished a sumptuous dinner, Hermione and I sat on the couch talking about random trivial things when we saw Harry and Ron come back. Harry had a scrunched up face that spelled worried all over it. There was also a hint of determination. I quickly read his mind and saw what happened, it wasn't that difficult as legilimency would bring up the memories of the target, and since Harry was in deep thought, the memories I saw first pertained to the issue I wanted to know about. It seems that he talked to McGonagall, and it appears that Quirrell has decided to act now while Dumbledore was also out of the castle. Naturally, Harry still thinks that it's Snape but that didn't matter. What's happening? Hermione asked with an expectant look. What do you mean? I asked. Don't what do you mean, me, what was he thinking to be pulling such a frown, she asked with a straight face. I, on the other hand, gaped at her implied meaning. You did not just assume I use legilimency on him, did you? I asked incredulously. How much have I corrupted the poor girl? Don't take me for a fool Tom, now spill the beans, she said with the same straight face. I could only shake my head in admiration. Admiration at my own work of art. Such a naive girl turning out like this, simply masterful work. Shut the hell up, God, how big is your ego, get to it, it's been so boring lately with all your stupid studying, let's have some fun with Baldy Baldy Drac said with a cackle. I could only shake my head before explaining what I saw to Hermione. And, only one chapter today, I was very tired. Hope you can understand chapter 65, and so it commences. Harry and Ron had just made it past our couch when I heard Ron's voice. Harry, you're mad, we can't do that, he argued as he shook Harry's shoulder. Hermione who had heard Ron looked in their direction as well. So what Ron, Harry shouted, don't you understand? If Snape gets hold of the stone, Voldemort is coming back? Haven't you heard what it was like when he was trying to take over? There won't be any Hogwarts to get expelled from. He'll destroy it, or worse, turn it into a school that teaches the dark arts. Losing points doesn't matter anymore, can't you see this? Do you think he'll give up killing you or your parents if we win the house cup? If I get caught before I can get to the stone, I'll just return to the Disleys and wait for Voldemort to kill me. I'm going through the trap door tonight, nothing you do will stop me, he said adamantly. Clap clap clap. Harry and Ron paused their argument when they heard the sound of clapping. They looked over towards where me and Hermione were. I stopped clapping since I had grabbed their attention successfully. Well, Potter, I must admit, you do have some redeemable qualities after all, and who knew you could actually use your brain, I thought it was only used to amass cobwebs, I said while feigning a surprised expression. But I do have to say, you are right on all accounts, this school would be over if Voldemort was allowed to return. And he would most definitely kill muggles and families who sympathize with them, I said turning my head towards Ron. As for your plan I doubt you two idiots would be able to get through the dog, let alone all the other traps, so I'll be coming with you to ensure our golden boy doesn't drop dead on us too soon, I said before standing up. Hermione got up at the same time as me and stood by my side quietly. H how do you know about the dog, asked Harry with a shocked expression. Well, let's just say I was curious about what Dumbledore was telling us to stay away from, it turns out to be a three-headed dog, I wonder how they got it in there, did they shrink it somehow? That's not important Tom, said Ron with an angry look. Right right, sorry it was a question I'll ask Dumbledore later, you don't have a problem with me joining you, right? I said with a grin. Ron was about to answer when I cut in, and don't forget, one word about this and you're stuck in here for the rest of the night, I wonder what would happen then. I said while holding my chin as if I was actually thinking about the consequences. Ron and Harry's faces paled slightly, and Hermione giggled at their reactions. Tom that's not nice, we will lose more points if you do that, she said half jokingly and half seriously. Eh fine, you can come with us, but we won't have enough room if we use my father's invisibility cloak, he blurted out before covering his mouth. I didn't really react to it, but Hermione looked at them questioningly. Harry was reluctant but eventually explained the use of his cloak which stunned Hermione for a good couple of seconds. That's not a problem, I have my way around it, we will follow behind you. Let's wait until night time to do so though, I added since we had a better chance of going undetected. As we were getting ready, I couldn't help but think about the conversation I had earlier this morning. Flashback. While everyone was walking out of the Dada exam, and I lagged behind purposefully. A week ago, during our couple of the last lessons in Dada, Quirrell presented himself as a servant of the Dark Lord. His task for me back then was to send a letter to the ministry that there was an urgent need for Dumbledore. Naturally, I was given the task under the premise that I was the adopted son of Lucius who he looked fondly upon. Well, that was what I fed him anyway. I naturally didn't have that connection, but I knew someone who did. 
I got Drac to send me the information pertaining to the use of Imperio and after a couple of hours, I was able to pull it off. It would have taken longer if it wasn't for Drac sending me the information. I used Imperio Andreco and made him write a letter to Lucius explaining that Voldemort needed Dumbledore out of the school so that he can be revived. A fake letter from the Ministry would do the trick. He emphasized that this was Voldemort's idea. Lest he thinks Draco grew a brain. Draco explained that he had made contact with the vessel Voldemort was currently residing in, Quirrell, to steal a stone in order to gain a body of his own. He mentioned his chance meeting during his detention in the forest which Draco would have reported to his father for sure, and that Quirrell who was actually Voldemort, recognized him. Naturally, due to the lack of time, he would give him this order now rather than before. He also said that he didn't mention anything in his last letter since he was nervous. Voldemort said that since Lucius was one of his loyal followers, he should do this and that there was no time to waste. It should be sent exactly a week from the moment this letter is received. Draco who was under the Imperio curse didn't hesitate and sent the owl to his father. And that brought us to the morning before the attempted robbery. I stayed behind to inform him that it had all been done according to the order. I have completed the task, Professor. Chapter 66, Dumbledore's Little Test Part 1. Gee good job, he said, seemingly annoyed, it was noticeable from his impatient and dismissive tone directed towards me. May I ask what the Dark Lord plans to do today? I asked curiously. None of your business. Quirrell hissed in an arrogant tone, go back to your common room and wait for future orders. I simply nodded my head and walked out of the room calmly. End of flashback. We were all ready, after waiting for everyone to go to sleep, Harry, Ron and I walked out of the men's wing, just in time to catch Hermione walking out of the girl's wing. As we walked down the steps and passed a couple of chairs, we soon heard a familiar yet shaky voice. W what are you all doing out of bed, said Neville from the corner of the room. He appeared from behind an armchair, clutching Trevor, his toad. He looked as though he'd been making another bid for freedom. I wondered what Neville did to the poor toad. And nothing, Neville, nothing, said Harry who turned sharply towards the source of the voice. He hurriedly hid the cloak behind his back. I could clearly see Neville not believing Harry's words at all, well anyone would notice what we were doing, out of bed at this hour, sneaking around, doesn't take a genius to figure out. You're going out again, aren't you, he said. I thought you said last time was a mistake Harry, and you Tom, he said looking in my direction with a disappointed look. What the hell was that for? No no no, interrupted Hermione, no, we're not. Why don't you go to bed, Neville, she asked trying to convince him. I could see Harry peering over at the grandfather clock leaning on the wall by the door. I could guess he was feeling pressured, but there actually wasn't any need to rush. After all, Quirrell would never get the stone. No matter how much he looked at it in the mirror. You can't go out, said Neville adamantly, clearly not swayed at all by Hermione's pleas. You'll be caught again. Greyfinder will be in even more trouble, he said getting a little angry. You don't understand, voiced Harry, this is much bigger than Poi Dash. Harry was cut off when he saw Neville getting up and stealing himself before pulling out his wand. I won't let yo dash he was cut off, flipendo. I voiced, waving my wand with a certain motion. It was a knockback jinx I had learned for dueling. Who knew I would use it for the first time against poor old Neville. I didn't give him a chance to move before using Petrifucus Totalis, effectively freezing him for a good couple of hours, or at least until something used finite on him. Harry and Ron showed shocked expressions while Hermione showed a regretful look while shaking her head. Moving on. I said, pointing at the door. Harry snapped out of his stupor and covered himself and Ron with the cloak. I cast all the concealment spells I knew, anti-smell, anti-sound, and a spell to conceal my figure by blending me in with my surroundings. I was like active camo. I had taught Hermione how to do them since it would be better for her to know rather than have me do it all the time. I had put a tracker on Harry like I did last time which allowed me to see his footprints. Hermione did the same and therefore had no problem following along. We soon made it to the third floor where we found the door locked after Harry tried to open it. What do we do now? Harry asked revealing his head from the cloak. I undid my anti-sound spell. Relax, let me do it, I said before walking towards the door and using the Alohomora charm on it. It worked like a charm, pun intended. We walked into the sound of a harp playing a soothing melody and a three-headed dog sleeping soundly. We all revealed ourselves quickly and stared at the dog. Look, over there, the door is under its foot, whispered Harry as he pointed at Fluffy's left paw. But before we could come up with a plan the melody stopped. Guys, the melody stopped, what are we going to do, said Ron as he stared at the dog that was awakening from its sleep. I smiled slightly and waved my wand towards the harp. It began to play a tune that was incredibly soothing and melodious. Ron, Harry, and even Hermione sighed in relief. We managed to move the paw from the door and just as the idiot Ron was about to jump in, I grabbed his collar and dragged him back. He fell on his ass with a thud before staring daggers at me. Why did you do that for? He hissed while rubbing his butt with his hand. What kind of idiot jumps into a hole without checking what's in it, dumbass? I responded with irritation. I walked over to the edge before casting Lomo's Maxima down the hole. The green snake-like vines that intertwined and overlapped came into sight. Everyone gasped, I ignored it and pointed my wand through the opening, Lumo Solemn, the once sturdy vines began to writhe in pain before receding. A hole was made, wide enough for us to fit through. Now we jump, I said before grabbing Ron and chucking him down the hole like a test dummy. 
Harry gave a reproachful look but only observed on from the ledge. We soon heard a thud and an ouch before jumping in ourselves. After all, Ron was the expendable one here, he had six other siblings to replace him at home. We soon landed on the ground and patted the dust off of our clothes that had covered us. I noticed the burning stare coming from Ron but chose to ignore it, maybe he'll snap, and I'll have the chance to break a couple of his bones. I grinned before walking forward with Hermione beside me. Harry helped Ron up before chasing after us. Chapter 67, Dumbledore's Little Test Part 2. We walked down a narrow corridor which only served to echo our footsteps. There was a gentle and rhythmic dripping of water trickling down the side of the walls. I have no clue where the water is coming from, neither do I know how this place can be an actual thing on the third floor. I mean how thick is the separation between floors to accommodate such a thing. But there could be magic involved, like compressing space like in a suitcase? Who knows? We continued down the narrow corridor, do you hear something? Asked Hermione. I stopped walking and so did the others, and as soon as the echoing of our footsteps stopped the fluttering of small wings could be heard. It was the key trial. We walked into the spacious room that was brilliantly lit, its ceilings arching to the heavens themselves. The sound seemed to be made by the dozens of keys with wings flying about like a school of fish. On the opposite side of the chamber, a smaller wooden door could be seen which was obviously locked. There must be a spell in the door since Alohomora didn't work upon trying it out. Naturally, I knew it wouldn't, but I had to keep up the act for appearance's sake. What do you think we have to do? Asked Ron as he stared at the large group of flying keys. Well, seeing that the lock is worn out, rusty and big, we should be looking for a key with those specific characteristics, I said calmly. There's nothing in here except a broom and a bunch of flying keys. Oh, so it seems one of them fits the lock on the door, said Hermione. I nodded in acknowledgement. Harry and Ron both looked at the broom and then at the flying keys. Flying a broomstick to get the key I assume, said Ron as he looked at Harry. I smiled and pulled out my wand before aiming it at the key I wanted. Oxio I said mildly. The key that was struggling to fly in the air was suddenly halted for a moment before coming down quickly and landing in my hand. It seems that the key trial was only meant to test the trivial skill of flying a broomstick. I shook my head slightly before walking towards the wooden door. Upon slotting the key into the hole, it went in like a glass slipper and opened with a creak. A room that was originally pitch black suddenly lit up with flame-lit candles on the sides of the walls, illuminating a black and white checkered design floor. Stone pieces were aligned on either side of the board shaped to fit a certain medieval look. The only difference was that one set was white while the other was black. Naturally, this was the fourth test. The chess game. Chess, said Ron as he looked at the similar yet different design. We got closer and Harry attempted to walk by only to be stopped by a black chess piece. Do we have to play to get across, asked Harry. The stone statue nodded before remaining still like before. I really wanted to learn this spell. It would be so cool to have an army of stone statues battling or even metal ones. Snapping out of my fantasy, I could hear Ron giving orders on where to stand. I looked on in slight amusement before shaking my head and walking towards the black ponds. I stood about 10 meters away before pointing my wand in front of me. Tom, what are you doing? Asked Ron in annoyance. Making this game a lot easier, I said with a grin. Bomarda Maxima. I spoke. The originally perfectly carved statue exploded into hundreds of pieces. But the explosion was bigger than I thought and blew up the surrounding five pieces. Harry, Ron, and Hermione stared on in shock and realization. I continued until all the pieces were destroyed except the king. I saw it get down from its stone throne and take off its crown and throw it on the floor. It almost looked indignant about how I did it, but it was probably my imagination. Blowing stuff up as usual I see, said Hermione as she stood beside me staring at my masterpiece. What can I say, it was a quick and easy solution, I shrugged while answering before walking towards the door that led to the next trial. Ready. I asked Harry, Ron, and Hermione who were behind me. They nodded and got ready for whatever was behind the door. As we walked through the door, we were hit by a foul odor that threatened to suffocate us, we covered our faces with our cloaks. But the smell was like a curse, it seeped through the cloak and made our eyes water. In the middle of the big room was a mountain troll similar to the one that was set loose inside the castle during Halloween. But this one was asleep or knocked out, by Professor Quirrell, nonetheless. I was curious about what his connection was with trolls. Was it simply an interest or did it go deeper? It was a question I probably wouldn't get an answer to. We hugged the rim of the wall and shuffled across in order to not startle the troll awake. I was not confident in winning without using Drac. It was tense for a good minute since the wall was long and our movements were slow to minimize sound. After what seemed like forever, we finally arrived at the door through which we all rushed in. Chapter 68, Dumbledore's Little Test Part 3. What appeared was a much smaller room with a table and seven potions laid out. As soon as we stepped in though, a fire spread around the room cutting off all possible routes of escape. We were trapped. Look, said Hermione as she seized the roll of paper lying next to the bottles. She spread it open on the table so that it could be read by everyone present. It read the following. Danger lies before you, while safety lies behind. Two of us will help you, whichever you would find. One among us seven will let you move ahead. Another will transport the drinker back instead. Two among our number hold only nettle wine. Three of us are killers, waiting hidden in line. Choose, unless you wish to stay here forevermore. To help you in your choice, we give you these clues for. First, however slyly the poison tries to hide. 
You will always find some on Nettlewine's left side. Second, different are those who stand at either end. But if you would move onwards neither is your friend. Third, as you see clearly, all are different size. Neither dwarf nor giant holds death in their insides. Fourth, the second left and the second on the right. Are twins once you taste them, though different at first sight. Hermione sighed but had an excited look while Harry and Ron looked on with furrowed brows. Extraordinary, said Hermione. This isn't magic it's logic? A puzzle. A lot of the greatest wizards haven't got an ounce of logic, they'd be stuck here forever. She said with sparkling eyes. I couldn't help but think about her words, she was right, most did lack logic, they were eccentric beings. You can see just how easily they are manipulated, how easy they are swayed by what the daily prophet says. They can't even understand what a goddamn rubber duck is for. It was baffling. So, you can figure it out, right? Asked Ron worriedly. Of course, she said patting her chest proudly. Everything we need is here on this sheet of paper. From the fourth clue, we know the contents of the red and black bottles are the same. Since the potions that allow the drinker to go forward or backward are unique, and from the third clue the biggest one could not be poison, red and black bottles must contain nettle wine, she said pointing at specific bottles from the seven. From the first clue, white and green bottles, to the left of nettle wine, must contain poison, she said moving her hand to point to the respective bottles. From the second clue, white and purple bottles had different contents but neither allowed the drinker to move forward, and since the white bottle contained poison, and the two bottles containing nettle wine were known, the purple bottle must contain the potion to go back. She said while once again pointing at the bottle she was talking about. From the third clue, the blue bottle, the smallest, could not be the poison, so it must contain the potion to go ahead while the yellow bottle was the third bottle with poison. She concluded. Ron and Harry were shocked at her conclusion. Harry stared at the blue bottle intensely. The only problem is, there is only one potion to go back, I added while looking at the purple one with a soft smile. Everyone was enlightened to this fact, and everyone had grim faces. Don't worry, Hermione, you go back and alert the professors of what is happening, me and Ron will stay here and wait for help, I said. I looked at everyone to see if there were any objections. Seeing that there were none, Hermione reluctantly took the potion and walked towards me. Be careful, I'll try to come back as soon as possible, she said seriously before walking into the flames. Instead of burning her, they parted and let her pass. Harry, Ron, and I turned towards each other. I smiled at the sight. Well, Harry, off you go, seeing that you're in such a rush to do the hero work, you can take the potion to advance forward, I said simply. Harry didn't argue and took the potion before walking through. Well, it seems you and me will be staying here for a while, said Ron sadly. Huh? Sure, like I'm going to stay here mate? See you in a jiffy, I said before walking towards the wall of fire that was stopping me from walking through. Ron jumped up, what are you doing? You can't go forwards or you'll be burned, he said quickly. Well, there are always spells for every occasion, right? I asked while stretching my hand into the fire. It didn't burn but instead felt nice and refreshing, Drac, I assume this is because of you. I asked while walking into the fire. Correct, since I am a dragon of fire, you are naturally immune to any fire damage, spell or anything of the sort he said proudly. Very convenient, I can't complain that it came in hand right now, I though before continuing it walk forward and through the open door that Harry had rushed in from. Ron's gasps and shouts were soon drowned out by the sound of fire crackling around me. I soon came upon a wide room with many pillars, a flight of stairs leading downwards into a depression where the mirror of Arist was sitting. In front of it was Quirrell who was talking to Potter. I made sure to use the concealing spells I learned to hide my presence and leaned behind a pillar and listened in to their conversation. Chapter 69, Where's My Popcorn Charm? As I leaned against the wall, I could hear Quirrell and Harry talking. You, gasped Harry incredulously. Quirrell smiled. His face wasn't twitching like it would usually be. Me, he said with an unusual calmness. I wondered whether I'd be meeting you here, Potter. Harry still had an unbelieving expression stuck on his face while shaking his head. But I thought, Snape. Severus. Quirrell laughed loudly, and it wasn't his usual quivering treble either, but a cold, mocking one. Yes, Severus does seem the type, doesn't he? So useful to have him swooping around like an overgrown bat. Next to him, who would suspect pee pee poor, st stuttering pee professor Quirrell. He acted with a smile. Harry continued to shake his head in denial, that can't be right, he must be helping you. He tried to kill me, he said adamantly. Huh? No no no. I tried to kill you twice, and both times failed. I have to say Potter, your luck is above average, Quirrell said with extreme annoyance. Plot armor I corrected. I used Confundus to send you towards the troll in order to get you killed, who knew that Dumbledore would come and save the day. And don't get me started on Snape, he was there stopping me from getting past that dreadful dog. If it wasn't for my weakened state, I would have simply killed it there and then, he said with a scowl. Then there's that meddling little Granger girl who set fire to Snape's cloak. In an attempt to put out the fire, Snape knocked everyone to the floor, including me. That was when I broke eye contact with you. Another few seconds and I'd have got you off that broom. I'd managed it before then if Snape hadn't been muttering a counter curse, trying to save you. Out of character for someone who seems to hate you so much I must admit. Snape saved me? Hermione. Harry asked with a shocked expression. Of course, said Quirrell as he waved his hand with the same annoyed expression. Why do you think he wanted to referee the following match? 
He was trying to make sure I didn't do it again. Funny, really, he needn't have bothered. I couldn't do anything with Dumbledore watching. It was a miracle I was able to pull it off once. All the other teachers thought Snape was trying to stop Gryffindor from winning, he did make himself unpopular with his personality, and what a waste of time, when after all that, I'm going to kill you tonight. Harry didn't have time to react before Quirrell snapped his fingers. Robes sprang out of thin air and wrapped themselves tightly around him. I was surprised, doing wandless magic in a weakened state, it seems that it was the right call to come here after all. Now, wait quietly, Potter. I need to examine this interesting mirror. Wasn't he literally staring at it by the time we came in? What, is he so egocentric that he was actually just staring at his reflection? I question. Typical villain, dumb as hell. This mirror is the key to finding the stone, Quirrell murmured, tapping his fingers over the frame of the mirror. Trust Dumbledore to come up with something like this, but he's in London. I'll be far away by the time he finds out what happened. I could see Harry's hysterical look at the last sentence Quirrell voiced. I saw you and Snape in the forest he blurted out. It seemed he was trying to buy time. For what? No one could save him if I wasn't here. Yes, said Quirrell idly, walking around the mirror to look at the back. He was on to me from pretty early on, like a dog, he was trying to find out how far I'd gotten. He tried to frighten me, as if he could, when I had Lord Voldemort on my side. Quirrell appeared from behind the mirror but this time on the other side and stared hungrily into it. I see the stone. I'm presenting it to my master, but where is it? He asked in frustration. I could see Harry struggling against the ropes that were binding him, but they didn't even budge. Snape always seemed to hate me so much though, Harry asked in a continued attempt to stall. Oh, he does, said Quirrell casually, heavens, yes. He was at Hogwarts with your father didn't you know? They loathed each other, but he never wanted you dead. But I heard you a few days ago, sobbing, I thought Snape was threatening you. I struggled to keep myself from laughing. I even covered my mouth which barely contained the otherwise compromising laugh. I could see Quirrell's originally calm face twitch for the first time since his whole charade began. Sometimes, he said slowly, I find it hard to follow my master's orders he is a great wizard, and I am weak dash. You mean he was in the classroom with you the whole time? Asked Harry with a shocked expression. He is with me wherever I go, said Quirrell, the arrogant air around him was crumbling slowly. I met him when I was traveling the world. A foolish young man I was then, full of ridiculous ideas and notions about what I thought good and evil were supposed to be. I realized that there was only gray, nothing as clearly defined as black or white. Lord Voldemort showed me this. He showed me how flawed my original ideals were. There is no good and evil, only power, and those too weak to seek it, since then, I have served him faithfully, although I have let him down many times. He has had to be very hard on me. Chapter 70, Still No Popcorn. Quirrell shuddered suddenly. He is not as forgiving when it comes to committing mistakes. When I failed to steal the stone from Gringotts, he was very angry with me. He punished me, decided he would have to keep a closer watch on me. He said, his voice trailing away. There was an eerie silence that hung in the air for a couple of minutes before an exasperated Quirrell huffed in displeasure. I don't get it, the stone is supposed to be in the mirror, so then why doesn't it appear? Maybe breaking it will work, he questions out loud to himself. As Quirrell was in deep thought immersed in the mirror's reflection, I saw Harry, inching ever so slightly to the side where his reflection appeared in the mirror. Just as he was about to stop, he tripped, and fell. I face palmed. Quirrell was still talking to himself like a lost child with nowhere to go. What does this mirror do? How does it work? Help me, master. A voice that I had heard under the hood in the forest appeared once again, the same raspy aged voice sounded, but this time from Quirrell's body. Use the boy, the boy. Quirrell seemed to be enlightened, like he saw the light at the end of the tunnel and instantly cheered up while sharply turning towards the still fallen Harry. That's right. Potter, come here, he said snapping his fingers, the ropes binding Harry tightened even more before beginning to levitate. Harry who was still bound flew slowly towards Quirrell before landing in front of the mirror. Look into the mirror and tell me what you see, he commanded sternly. Harry, not being able to move could only look towards the mirror with a worried expression. I couldn't see what he was seeing but basing it off of my memory and the fact that something appeared in his pocket I assume he got the stone. To think it was that easy to get. Geez, if only Quirrell knew how the mirror worked, he could have used Imperio on a student in order to get the stone. Since the mirror will only give the stone to someone who is looking for it but doesn't want to use it, it completely complies with the rules set by Dumbledore. It was shocking to see how little research Quirrell put into this plan of his. Well, he said impatiently. What do you see? Spit it out. I I see myself shaking hands with Dumbledore, I, seem to have won the house cup. I face palmed, that was the best he could come up with, really? House cup? God save us all. Quirrell seemed to believe it though which made me even more dissatisfied, I wonder if some higher being was really just toying with the lives of the masses? Who knew, there weren't answers to my questions, and even more so, no one to ask for said answers. Quirrell cursed, get out of the way Potter, he said shoving the still bound Harry to the floor. As Quirrell was about to shatter the mirror the same old voice echoed throughout the hall. He lies, he lies. Potter. Quirrell shouted like a kid who had been tricked out of his lollipop. Tell me the truth. What did you just see? The raspy, aged voice spoke, let me speak to him, face to face. But master, we don't have much strength left. Quirrell reminded. I have enough for, this. 
Harry who was lying on the floor had a look of shock and horror as he saw Quirrell take off the purple turban that had always been stuck to his head. Quirrell's head was actually the size of a rock melon at best. It was tiny, maybe that was why he was so stupid, his brain was underdeveloped I thought seriously. Quirrell, under the shocked speechless gaze of Harry, turned around to reveal a pale white, dried up face, red beady eyes and slits for nostrils. Not going to lie, he was definitely not a good looking fellow. Riddle was always portrayed as a good looking chap, to end up looking like this, immortality was defiantly not worth it. Harry Potter he whispered as if struggling to raise his voice. Did he have a microphone under that rag of a turban? Why is he suddenly so quiet? I thought. Look what I have become because of you. The face contorted, mere shadow and vapor. I am forced to live inside of another living creature, like a mere parasite. But there were always those who have been willing to let me into their hearts and minds. Unicorn blood has allowed me to remain inside of Quirrell here for much longer than usual, all for this moment. You saw Quirrell drinking it in the forest, and once I have the elixir of life, I will be able to make another body of my own. Now, why don't you give me the stone in your pocket? I waved my wand silently which loosened the ropes around Harry, allowing him to break free and stumble backwards. Don't kid yourself, said the face with a mocking smile. Better save your own life and join me, or you'll meet the same fate as your parents. They died, begging for my mercy, he said with a cackle. Well, technically the only one who begged was Snape, he begged to spare Lily. I didn't think Voldemort would have it in him to comply with such a request, that was probably why he gave Lily so many chances to step away, and the actual reason for his death. The sacrificial spell only works when the target has a choice. Funny how things work. Liar, yelled Harry defiantly. The face contorted into an evil smile, how touching, I always valued bravery. Yes, Potter, your parents were brave. I killed your father first, and he put up little resistance, I don't know what part of him was talented but either way he soon fell. But your mother? Ho, your mother was brave, she didn't have to die, I even gave her many chances to walk away, but she protected you to the very end. Commendable, but futile. Now give me the stone, unless you want her sacrifice to be for naught, he said sternly. Chapter 71, unhinged. Never. Harry yelled. Fine, have it your way, he said with a grimace. Quirrell as if jolted by electricity jumped into action. He pointed his wand at Harry, avid a dash. Before he could finish an orb of light appeared in front of him before sending him flying. Harry turned his head to see Tom walking down the stone steps. Quirrell used a weird spell that turned the floor into a rubber-like substance that broke his fall. Quirrell was about to cast another spell when Tom used Expulso forcing him to dodge once again. He really hated to waste all that effort back in the forest, but letting Harry die was out of the question. He also didn't find a way to spin it off where he had the upper hand since if he revealed himself, he would be put into a passive position, and Harry would know he had some dealings with Voldemort. Harry being Harry would snitch to Dumbledore and that would not end well. But he didn't regret spending the time to talk to Voldemort since having a backup plan ensured a way out. Having something to fall back on would allow him to stall for time while he thought of a solution. He turned his head towards Harry who was still laying on the floor like an idiot. Are you going to simply sit on your ass Harry? He asked in annoyance. Harry snapped out of his stupor and stood up laboriously. He freed himself from the loose rope and stared at the kneeling Quirrell. Trey Dash Quirrell wasn't able to finish before Reducto came flying towards him. He dodged to the side and ran towards Harry. He shot out a green beam of light that startled Tom. Forced to dodge, he didn't have a choice but to separate from Harry. As he landed, he saw Quirrell kicking Harry in the stomach which threw him to the ground. Now, let's try that again, Avida Dash another attack was sent towards Quirrell's direction by Tom. Quirrell being interrupted yet again quickly dodged, but suddenly saw an odd scene. The attack landed on Harry instead, sending him flying through the air. Upon landing, he was knocked out cold due to hitting his head. Tom sighed in relief. Finally, he was free to let loose for a while. Suddenly, the air around Tom began to change as if another person had descended in his body. He stopped pretending, he stopped holding back. I had strings, but now I'm free, he said slowly and with a smile. I did hope you'd last long enough for me to have my fun, but seeing how frail you are, I think it will not be possible. He lamented while shaking his head. At the very least, do entertain me for a few rounds, said Tom stretching his neck as the temperature began to rise. With every step he took, a depression was made where molten pieces of stone could be seen in the shape of footprints. All that power and look where it got you, disappointing, he said as his voice began to get deeper and more sinister, it was clear he wasn't talking to Quirrell. His eyes changed from bright blue to a blood red. His hands released smoke as they lit up with black flames. W what are you? Quirrell said stuttering again as he took a step back. Even Voldemort was silent. Me? Pest control. I heard fire is most effective on bugs, Tom said mockingly. He waved his arm upwards causing a slash-like figure to form from black flames which burst outwards in Quirrell's direction. He tried to dodge and was successful but landed forcefully on the ground. Quirrell got up with a grunt and sent an avida towards Tom only for it to be dodged with slight effort. Tom didn't say anything and continued to walk at a steady pace, inching forward towards Quirrell with every passing second. There was only so much room left before they would be face to face. This isn't supposed to end like this, what are you, who are you really? Quirrell yelled hysterically as he backed up continuously while sending all kinds of attack spells towards Tom. 
Tom easily blocked them by using the different types of protego spells he had learned. Sometimes they reflected back in random directions, sometimes they landed accurately forcing Quirrell to dodge once again. There is no point in telling a dead man, he said monotonously before stretching his hand out in front of him. A massive wave of black fire spread out in a fan-like shape towards Quirrell. An aged voice could be suddenly heard chanting something before Quirrell disappeared and reappeared next to Harry. Quirrell upon landing kneeled on the ground panting heavily. Grab the stone? Now, yelled Voldemort hurriedly. As Quirrell attempted to reach his hand out, a demonic voice could be heard. There is no escape from me, said the voice from behind Quirrell. Voldemort stared into Tom's bloody red eyes. He felt the hatred and the power behind that gaze. It was like a beast was staring at him hungrily. It was a puzzling feeling, he didn't know why he felt like that. But for the first time in his life, he felt like prey. Tom grabbed Quirrell's shoulder and lifted him up before throwing him effortlessly across the room, smashing into a wall. Spiderweb-like cracks spread all over the stone wall, as Quirrell's disfigured form could be barely made out amongst the rubble. Tom walked towards him before stumbling and falling to one knee. Don't push yourself, you're overdrafting my power. Reel it in, you will have your chance later warned Drac as he observed Tom's condition. Tom nodded slightly but the red light coming from his eyes shone even brighter. Tom got up again as if nothing happened and made his way towards Harry. He chucked the unconscious boy's body over his shoulder and walked towards the immobile Quirrell who was struggling to move. Incarcerous. Tom spoke, it was to avoid any accidents from occurring. Quirrell who was now tied by thick ropes wasn't able to move his arms and was therefore unable to cast any magic. Expelliar miss, he cast right after. You could never be too careful. What are you planning to do? Asked Voldemort with a frown. His face was fine since Quirrell had his embedded into the stone. Don't tell me you forgot already? The sacrificial spell that got you killed all those years ago, he answered with a mocking smile. Voldemort's face contorted to the extreme as he glared viciously at Tom. How do you know such a thing? He yelled demandingly. You are in no place to be asking questions, let alone in such a tone, Tom reprimanded with the same mocking smile. He lowered Harry and grabbed his left wrist before placing it on Quirrell's left arm. It began to blister as the muffled, pain-stricken wails of Quirrell could be heard from within the stone wall. The left arm began to turn gray and before long, it was reduced to ash which fell to the floor softly like snowflakes. Tom approached Voldemort's face and stood 20 centimeters away. Till next time, he said with a smile before bringing Harry's hand parallel Voldemort's face. As soon as it made contact, the screams of pain could be heard from Quirrell while the furious yells could be heard from Voldemort as his red eyes stared at Tom's smiling face from between the gaps in Harry's fingers. Chapter 72, Plan Successful. Aaaaa. Quirrell's screams were getting louder and louder as he struggled tremendously in the ropes. Voldemort was quiet as he stared at Tom. I will make sure to get you for this, Thomas, you and Lucius, he hissed through his clenched teeth with much effort. Tom took Harry's hand off of Voldemort's face for a moment as he began to laugh. Pfft, you're still believing the words I said to you. Tom asked as he laughed loudly. Voldemort was stunned for a moment before he was struck if a realization. You lied, he bellowed. Tom nodded, it seems you're not so dense after all. But it was such a shame, I never did anything with it. But what can you do, it was better than having no backup plan. He shrugged. But then, how did you manage to send that letter to the ministry? He asked between gritted teeth. Oh, that? I'll tell you since it's of no consequence. It was easy, I just used Imperio on that dumbass Draco, making him write a letter to his father. Lucius being the oh-so-loyal dog that he is, did what was asked of him. You got what you wanted which was an opening and I kept my cover. Any more questions? Because if not I'll be searing your face off now, he said with a smile. Voldemort was shocked at what he heard. He was thoroughly played. Why stay in the light, the dark side has cook cough the dark side, my side, has a lot to offer, anything you wish for. I need a smart person like yourself by my side, there is still time to fix this, he said in a last ditch attempt to convince Tom. As tempting as your offer is, there is simply no reason for me to join you. I'm on my own side. As for staying in the light that is all in your head, I am not opposed to murder if it allows me to achieve my goals. But neither do I kill senselessly like a demented lunatic. So, in a way, I'm the best of both worlds, but bound by neither, he said with shrug. Voldemort tried to say something, but his face was covered by Harry's palm. Back to the drawing board with you old man, Tom said with a chuckle. He was cut off however by Quirrell's final death throes. He soon became completely grey and lost almost all his facial features. It was like he was a statue made of ash. And just like so, he collapsed inwards and fell to the ground. The ropes that once bound him tightly now fell to the ground before disappearing. Voldemort's sole apparition that looked like black smoke flew around desperately before descending into the wall and escaping quickly. Tom stood there looking at the wall with some regret. As I stared at the wall I was deep in thought. I wish I had a way to hurt his soul, but there doesn't seem to be any apart from Avida. But if I used it on Quirrell, it would hurt Quirrell's soul, not Voldemort's. Avida was a mixture between a physical and a non-physical spell where it requires touching a target physically in order to activate but doesn't leave any damage. At least that was what I could deduce from the books and movies. It was a weird spell since in some instances it would shatter stone, but when hitting a human there is no damage done. That brought me my current conjecture about the curse. It was irrelevant since I couldn't use it. It wasn't that I lacked the killing intent for it, but that it had a negative effect on the body of the individual. 
Well, a negative effect when used by a growing child. That was why Dumbledore had Snape kill him instead of Draco. Using such a spell can prove to have a serious effect on the soul. I didn't feel like doing that to myself when I don't know what price I need to pay. It wasn't like there weren't a million other ways to kill him. I just needed to bide my time. I walked towards Harry with a limp before kneeling beside him. I reached into his pocket and grabbed the stone that sat there quietly. I stared at the object Voldemort wanted so badly. The red luster made it incredibly appealing, very beautiful to stare at, as if it belonged on the neck of a fair-skinned beauty. I had many hypotheses about the stone. It was said that it could turn basic metals into gold, cool enough on its own, but it could also grant immortality to the user. Nicholas Flamel was a perfect example. Although not a very suitable form of immortality since you become brittle, as if a light breeze would shatter you into a million pieces. But immortality it gave, nonetheless. What it didn't mention, however, was a way to give others life once they are dead or give others a body. It seems that was what caught Dumbledore's attention to the stone all those years ago, and it was the secret that in turn attracted Voldemort. I had the suspicion that Aurelius Dumbledore formerly known as Credence Barebone was a product of such an experiment. In an attempt to resurrect his dead sister, Dumbledore created Aurelius. What I think happened was that Dumbledore kept Ariana's Obscurus which was proven possible due to Newt Scamander having kept one in that illegal suitcase of his. Following this train of thought, Dumbledore, who was distraught after the death of Ariana got in touch with Flamel to see if they could use the stone on the Obscurus. That would explain why Credence was able to survive after blowing up, seemingly able to control the power. But instead of resurrecting Ariana, Dumbledore, and Flamel ended up creating a new life. Realizing that this was beyond their area of expertise, Dumbledore made the most irresponsible decision he could make. Send Aurelius overseas and let him live amongst muggles. I didn't see it as something beneath Dumbledore since he proved to do just that with Harry. Sure, the circumstances were different but the idea was the same. All this proves, is that there is some way to give a body to something or someone using the stone. If my conjecture proves true, then that was what Voldemort was going for. I guess he might have been banking off of the fact that a soul was present which would allow him to reside in the new body without being pushed out. Since Ariana's soul wasn't present and the Obscurus used the stone, it was rational to think that Ariana wouldn't come back. Her soul didn't reside in the Obscurus after all. It was a separate entity. I couldn't think any further as my vision began to blur and before long it faded into total darkness. When I awoke, I found myself atop a comfortable bed with a bright light shining down from the windows. It wasn't long before I came to myself and heard the talking of two people. Harry and Dumbledore. Chapter 73, Disagreement. Lovely afternoon isn't it, Harry, asked Dumbledore as he looked out the window. Harry's originally calm face contorted with worry as he attempted to sit up only to wince in pain. Sir, the stone? It was Quirrell, he was the one who attempted to steal the stone? He must have ESC his voice faded fast as he saw Dumbledore's hand rise up. What about me you stupid dumbass? I literally saved you fucking life. I cursed in my head as I heard his words. Ungrateful bastard. Calm yourself Harry my boy, you are, a little behind the times, he said before looking at me from the corner of his eye. I only grinned slightly before pretending to sleep. Quirrell does not have to stone, he said slowly and confidently. But, Harry sounded hesitant, as if finding it hard to believe. Harry relax, or Madame Pomfrey will kill us all, said Dumbledore with a chuckle. I opened my eyes when he said that, it did in fact look like the infirmary. I looked over at the nightstand that was next to my bed only to see a thick book on it. It was puzzling but upon turning my head to see Harry's I couldn't help but frown, his was covered in sweets. It seems being an inept idiot earned more brownie points from the masses. It really was the upside down, only here in a magical high school would others look down on you for being smart. Tokens of your friends and admirers, said Dumbledore with a smile. I almost choked at his words. Who in their right mind would admire him? He did jack shit the entire time. The only he did was taste Quirrell's shoelaces. The injustice. What happened down in the dungeons between you and Professor Quirrell is not a complete secret, so, naturally, the whole school knows. I believe your friends Mr. Fred and George Weasley were responsible for sending you a toilet seat. No doubt they thought it would amuse you, he said with a warm smile. Something caught my attention, the lack of items on my nightstand, completely ignoring my existence can only mean that I wasn't mentioned. Sure, it was my goal, but I exhausted myself and couldn't talk to Dumbledore before I fainted I thought seriously. Yeah, about that. That was my doing. As soon as you fell asleep Dumbledore arrived, I quickly took over your body and explained the situation to him and exclude you from the news as a form of repayment for saving the boy's life. He readily agreed. Luckily, we have the stone, or we would be screwed on how to extort the old man. He actually traded saving Harry for excluding you from a rumor said Drac angrily. Upon hearing that I couldn't help but nod in admiration. Dumbledore sure knew how to turn the situation in his favor. Wait. I thought before touching my pocket only to feel the stone in it, tightly hidden in my robes. Thinking about Dumbledore's scheming nature there is no way he would just let me have it. There's no way he actually left me a way out? Nah, he can't be a good person, I refuse to believe it. I thought adamantly. There must be a catch. How long have I been in here? Harry asked awaking me from my internal argument. Three days. Mr. Ronald Weasley will be most relieved you have come round, he has been extremely worried. But professor, if he doesn't have the stone. He stopped. 
Insistent on that matter, aren't you, Harry? Asked Dumbledore with an amused expression. Okay, well, the stone. Professor Quirrell didn't manage to take it. I thank you and Mr. Knight for that. You did extremely well on your own, I must say. Harry who seemed to have realized something turned towards me with a surprised expression. But it didn't last long before he got downcast. I was useless, he said. Yes, exactly. I yelled sitting up quickly before realizing what I said. I didn't mean to actually say it out loud damn it. I looked at Harry's reproachful gaze and could only smile apologetically. Are you okay? He asked begrudgingly. It seemed that whatever good intentions about me he had, died off again with what I said. Exhaustion of magic, torn muscles, but he is good as new, as you can see, Dumbledore said happily before I could answer. I see, so you got Hermione's message then? Harry asked. I arrived at Hogwarts in time when Miss Granger came looking for me. Sir, said Harry. I've been thinking, even if the stone is gone, Valdash, I mean, you know who. Call him Voldemort, Harry. Always use the proper name for things. Fear of a name increase fear of the thing itself. He spoke. I think you are mistaken professor. I interjected as I sat up on the bed. How so young man? Asked Dumbledore with intrigue. I don't say his name not out of fear but because it's plain idiocy to do so. After all, the taboo curse has been placed on that part of his name. I would think that a great wizard like yourself would know this. And if you do, then why advertise his name to everyone you meet? It tracks the person who says it. Very useful for let's say, kill a certain someone. I said looking at Harry. He hasn't stopped saying it all year, if he was alone in the world and you know who was alive and well, poor old Harry would be chased around like a dog, I spoke. Naturally, I was talking about the time he said the name in the forest and was subsequently chased and caught before being sent to the Malfoy mansion. Dumbledore's recklessness never ceases to amaze me. Chapter 74, Good Old Love. Dumbledore looked at me seriously for a moment before smiling radiantly again. Even if that is the case, limiting yourself to not say his name, will, whether consciously or unconsciously, develop a wariness and in most cases a subtle fear of the man inside the psyche of a person. This allows his influence to increase my boy, he said calmly, and that will not help any of us. But you don't have to worry about it, inside of Hogwarts you are all safe, he said confidently. I didn't really bother taking his words seriously. Such words were much more useful in front of a crowd of sheep, rather than on me. After all, Sirius Black, freshly out of prison and out of his mind, was able to get in with no one being none the wiser. His words didn't hold much weight. Let's not even count the number of times he's been kicked out of the school. Safe my ass. Sir, the problem is, Voldemort is going to try other ways of coming back, isn't he? I mean, he's not gone, has he? No, Harry, he is not. He is still out there somewhere, perhaps looking for another body to share, not being truly alive, he cannot be killed. He left Quirrell to die, he shows just as little mercy to his followers as he does to his enemies. Nevertheless, Harry, while you have only delayed his return to power, it will merely take someone else who is prepared to fight what seems to be a losing battle next time he may never truly return to power if he is delayed over and over again. He said seriously before turning his head towards me. So, Mr. Knight, would you like to explain how you managed to take down Quirrell, in a certain way, by yourself? Asked Dumbledore with curiosity. I flinched slightly. I needed to choose my words carefully. I began to explain my side of the story from when I met Ron all the way to when I interrupted Quirrell from killing Harry. I said that I had simply soaked myself in water and used a separation charm to spill the wall of flames. Dumbledore didn't seem to believe it but there was no way I was telling him the truth. I then explained my fight to him, the trading of spells and the use of protego that I had learned from a fourth year student. When I said that last part Dumbledore looked at me with an odd glint in his eye, I knew he had received word of my endeavor to the roar. But it was of no consequence as no one was harmed. I didn't mention me using my fire for obvious reasons. I said that in the process of battling, I noticed that Quirrell's right arm was slightly blistered. I mentioned that I noticed it when Quirrell kicked Harry and grazed his arm against Harry's hand. This was actually true just that it was inconsequential to the final result. But a good way to explain how I killed him. I explained that upon tying Quirrell up with the use of Incarcerus I used Harry's hand to burn the rest of Quirrell, effectively killing him. Dumbledore didn't question the last part as it was true. Most of it was actually, just that a bit of word manipulation here and there, allowed for a watered-down version of events. I see, you are a very observant young man, Tom, he said with a smile. Sir voiced Harry as he stared at his hands. There are some other things I'd like to know, if you can tell me, things I want to know the truth about. He said thoughtfully. Ah, the truth. Such a beautiful yet also terrible thing. And, should therefore be treated with the necessary caution. However, I shall answer your questions unless I have a good enough reason not to do so, in which case I beg forgiveness. I shall, of course, not lie, he said softly. Harry asked about what Voldemort said about his parents, about his mother, and their death. Alas, the first thing you ask, I cannot tell you. Not today, not now. You will know, one day, put it from your mind, for now, Harry. Okay, but you must be able to tell me why Quirrell wasn't able to touch me, right? According to Tom, he suffered heavy damage when he did so and even ended up dying. He asked seriously. Your mother died to save you. If there is one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it is love. He didn't realize the power of love, and that love as powerful as your mother's, leaves its own mark. 
Not a scar, no visible sign, to have been loved so deeply, even though the person who loved us is gone, they will still give us some protection forever. Quirrell, who was full of negative emotions, and sharing his body with a being as evil as Voldemort found it agonizing to touch you. To touch something so pure of heart. He spoke. Professor, it seems you're quite muddle-headed today, I said seriously. Sure, there was truth in what he said, but love by itself is meaningless. It is worth nothing. Something wrong with what I said, asked Dumbledore. The way you put things is the issue, you're confusing the facts, I said while shaking my head. What? asked Harry as he looked back and forth between me and Dumbledore. Mr. Knight, can you explain what love is to you? He asked as he looked at me with the same warm smile. I believe that my meaning of love and the meaning it has towards magic are two separate things. It is of no concern or importance what love means to me personally, but since we are talking about what love means in magic, what it signifies, then I find it quite relevant. Love in a sense acts as a barrier, a stopper of sorts. Especially when it concerns dark magic, considering people lose their ability to love when they fall deep enough under the dark arts. But the same love could stop them from losing their basic sanity. You could say that love is a double-edged sword. It can bring you power, but it can also weaken and even cripple you. Harry was silently listening to the side, while Dumbledore questioned, Weaken? Cripple? Yes, love is a fickle thing. If you feel love, you can use it to train you magic, fuel it, make it more powerful. It allows you to build allies, family, friends, so, even when you're weak you're stronger together. I paused. Well said. Dumbledore nodded contently with a smile, I only wish more wizards like you appeared, that more people held such a dash. Don't get me wrong, I disdain such an approach. I believe that when you are powerful enough, such trivial concepts become irrelevant. Ten thousand ants cannot beat an elephant. When it comes down to the wire, I wouldn't want to rely upon others to reach my goal. Friends, family, allies, they are simply sentimental attachments that only serve to chain you up and drown you. Yet, after saying all these words, I am guilty of being tied down by this very notion. Such is the irony, I said mockingly. Like I said before, a double-edged sword, wherever there are benefits, there must also be drawbacks. In this case, the lives of our loved ones. I said simply. Chapter 75, Funny Misunderstandings. Dumbledore looked at me deeply for a long time before sighing. Mr. Knight, you have proven time and time again that you are one of the most talented people I have seen, but it seems you are plagued with doubt. You contradict yourself. I just hope, whatever inner demon you are facing, doesn't stop you from feeling love. You should know perfectly well what that can do to a person, he said meaningfully. His words, seemed, for the first time, to have struck a chord in me. It seemed I had to work on myself a lot more than I had thought. I do hope to see you in my office for a cup of tea and sherbet lemons, he said with a smile. I nodded silently. There was a lot to talk about. Mostly the stone, about how I actually defeated Voldemort, and most importantly, about the benefits I would gain from all of this. It seemed I would be there for a while. Harry and Dumbledore started talking about the mirror and how Harry managed to get the stone which I didn't pay attention to. There was no mystery, anyone with half a brain can figure it out. Okay, maybe not half, but a small complete one was enough for sure. Dumbledore got up but didn't forget to take one of Betty Bot's every flavor of beans. He naturally got earwax which didn't fail to make me chuckle slightly. He then walked out of the infirmary leaving me and Harry all alone. Thank you, Tom, said Harry as he looked at me. I laughed slightly, don't overthink things Harry, humans are greedy and manipulative, there was an opportunity to get something from helping you, so I therefore took it simple as that, I said while waving it off. Harry seemed to be confused but I didn't bother to explain. There was no point in telling a chicken that the only reason it's alive is to lay eggs. Tom, what did you mean about love magic? How was it used in my case, he asked curiously. Some spells need the user to meet a certain set of requirements for it to be active. In your case, well I guess your mother met all the conditions and used the spell, essentially protecting you from complete harm. Those conditions being. My mother's death said Harry with a downcast look. Right. I nodded. There was an awkward silence in the room which I took as a K to do my own thing. I reached out to get the book on the nightstand. As soon as I touched the book, I heard voices from the door. Just five minutes? Please. Absolutely not. But you let Professor Dumbledore in. Well, that's natural. He is the headmaster of course. It is completely different to letting a bunch of reckless students in. They need rest, not screams. But Professor McGonagall said that they were awake. Please Madame Pomfrey. Oh very well then, but only five minutes and not a second longer. As soon as she said that Hermione and Ron rushed in. Harry, yelled Ron as he rushed to Harry's side. Tom, yelled Hermione as she rushed to my side with a half teary half angry expression. She didn't stop when I thought she would and continued before jumping onto the bed and landing on me before wrapping her arms around my neck. She was like that for a little while before Madame Pomfrey saw it and immediately threatened to kick her out if she continued. For once, I was happy about Madame Pomfrey's decision. Hermione was crushing me with her hug. She soon composed herself and looked at me angrily. It seems that you took it upon yourself to be a hero, she said strictly and with annoyance before punching my arm hard. This mood swing was not normal. That was some wrecking ball type swings. Ow. I groaned while rubbing my arm. My muscles had been strained to the limit and here she is, punching me like a brute. You know I'm injured yet you still punch. Oof. 
I don't see anyone complaining but you, she said with a smile. I looked at Harry and Ron who were off to the side smiling as they enjoyed the show, but as soon as they saw me looking at them, they flinched and turned away. I turned back to see Hermione patting my arm softly, it seemed that she was a little bit guilty. She then proceeded to hug me again but much softer, stupid idiot, running off like that. She murmured on my shoulder. I only smiled and silently patted her head with the only arm that wasn't numb. It didn't last long though as the hug turned murderously tight again. Can't, breath, please, let go. I said laboriously as I patted her back with as much force as I could muster. She seemed to realize what she was doing and let go with an apologetic smile. The whole school is talking about the incident Harry. But there is no mention of Tom anywhere, did you even help? Or did you faint and chuck all the responsibility onto Harry's shoulders? He asked as he looked over at me with anger building up with every word he said. I couldn't help but laugh, I laughed so hard my ribs hurt. I looked over at Harry as I wiped my tears and saw his extremely gloomy face.